Hello, fellow writers. I'm Lewis. That over there is Tolkien, and you have found the Scriptarian Society. Welcome back, you beautiful writers, to your favorite podcast all about writing. That over there is Carissa Harlow, aka Lewis, aka Catherine. And I am Asha Work, aka Tolkien. And I almost called you Tolkien again this time, but I didn't. So that was me catching Dang. it, but then still copying to the almost mistake. Nice. Uh, and uh, apologies in advance for my audio. If it sounds like whoosh, in the background, it's because the AC is on and it is about 108 degrees outside. So I cannot turn it off. Um, yep. I did turn off the fan to try and make it a little quieter. But um, I think that if I turn it off now, the house temperature will shoot up. And then when I turn the AC back on, it will just kaputs because it's not going to be able to make up the difference. Yeah. Got to leave yeah. it running for sure. Yeah. It's super hot here too. I think it's 110 today. So I feel you. That's horrible. Ugh. Yeah. At least, I mean, I mean it's, is it humid? I mean, at all, or is it like a drier day? I mean, there? it rained a couple days ago, so it's more humid than usual, but not like Texas humid, if that makes yeah. sense. Okay. So, well, in between, but yeah. Well, and I, I usually get to stay inside. I've stayed inside for most of the day, which has been nice. So, yeah. Um, anyways, how has your last two weeks been? Because we do this every other week um, now. I know. It's been good. Um, I've been in kind of a, strange mood lately so okay so anniversaries of things they're so weird because I started having dreams starting about a week ago about my grandfather who mm -hmm. died about two years ago mm -hmm. and I was like that's so weird like why am I dreaming about him and then my parents were talking and they're like yeah it's been two years today that he died wow. and I'm like how did my subconscious know that I don't that's understand crazy. you're really so, good at remembering anniversaries of all kinds I, though like I am I'm pretty good at birthdays. An anniversary gift to Javi and I and I was like I didn't mm -hmm. even remember our anniversary <laughs> <laughs> yeah Amazing. so I yeah maybe my brain is just wired to remember anniversaries or something but I hadn't been consciously thinking about it and yet my brain was still like hey this is a thing that happened two years ago do you want yeah. to remember and I was like no you're like no um, thanks <laughs> it's like so, too late. <laughs> yeah exactly so I mean it's been like I don't want to say it's been emotional but it's been just a strange particularly past week or so um just because of all because of the dreams the emotions yeah, yeah the dreams and I'm like thinking about my grandfather and then like other yeah. people that have died so I'm just like I'm not depressed I'm just like not in a great mood if that makes sense. melancholically so. thoughtful yeah melancholically that's, introspective yeah that's melancholy <laughs> not yeah. melancholic not melancholy Melan not like because of melancholically but I don't know melancholically melancholicky I don't know anyway Whatever word describes that feeling. Introspective so. with an air of melancholy. <laughs> yeah, know. that's accurate. So there we go. Uh, yeah, there's been that. Um, and on the brighter side, uh, so school, the school systems are starting up here in about another couple weeks. So my family oh, that's crazy. had August, like summer, like just early started. August, right? <laughs> Yeah. And so my family, a couple of, well, one of whom is still in high school, we all kind of got together and had like a before back to school game night, which was Aww, pretty fun. That's cute. Um, yes, yeah, so that was cool. And yeah, that's pretty much been my week, my weeks. Nice. How have your weeks been? <laughs> uh, my weeks have been good. We moved my mom. So nice. that was, uh, that was fun. Um, I was as helpful as I could be being um uh, six months pregnant a little over six months pregnant so yeah. I am real pregnant everything hurts and I'm hungry all the time um but then I eat and, and you're only two-thirds there <laughs> I know it's killing me um and there's like I'm hungry all the time but also like there's no room for my stomach to expand because there's an enormous baby in the way yeah so <laughs> that's fun and also baby is getting so big now that like I can feel every movement because there is no room for baby to move so even when it's not like mm -hmm. a punch or a kick I'll just feel like something like squirm across the inside of my stomach and I'm like Ugh, every time <laughs> just stay still geez <laughs> yeah but um but it's it's fun and baby starting to respond to like my voice and my touch which is very cool Yay. um cool. that's always fun uh, as if I've ever had a baby before. I just yeah, people yeah, have talked about part. it. Everyone <laughs> loves this part. Everybody talks about it, and I've been like, whatever. Baby can't do that. Literally, baby is like moving right now because I just rubbed uh, my stomach. <laughs> hi, baby. <laughs> Say hello to your auntie Carissa. Hello, I'm not baby. talking to you, Ruby. Ruby's like, hello. 
Yes. <laughs> is that You're, me? <laughs> Ruby is here also thinking Hi, that she's dying uh, because she's not getting attention and because I'm speaking to another person that's not her. Um, <sighs> yeah. So in the process of moving, uh, my mom, basically a lot of, we were using a lot of her furniture because instead of storing it, we're like, yeah, we'll just use it. And then we don't have to get new furniture. So mm-hmm. um, we ended up switching some furniture from her boyfriend's house. Get away from me, Ruby. I don't like it when you lick me just screw it. listen I know some people love it when dogs lick and if it's somebody else's dog I'm flattered but for some reason if it's my dog I'm like that's disgusting get your tongue off of me <laughs> I am the reverse I don't like it when other people's dogs like me but when mine do I'm like this is fine we're basically uh, related <laughs> I, I think also Ruby does this weird like long lingering lick on my leg she goes like and I'm like ew could you just like not she do that silent about it geez <laughs> she's, and it's such a long lick I'm like just lick me and be done don't like savor it it's so weird oh my gosh um, that is funny Aurora like kind of pins me when she wants to lick me so I'm uh, like okay I either have to shove you or just put up with or it just, so. or just accept that this is happening <laughs> yeah that's too yeah. funny but anyway so we ended up uh, trading some furniture because he had some furniture he was getting rid of and it was like really nice like heavy wooden furniture so we have a new coffee table I have a new desk which I'm at right now it's in our living room um so if you guys are watching this on YouTube you can see I do have a bookshelf see it's right there there's also another one right out of sight of the camera in front of me uh and I have more books that do not fit on them but uh those are and there's my typewriter on the other side with some journals in it but uh I'm very happy love a new desk I've got more space on this desk and um, I started my new job. So I've been um, doing that at my new desk. And I, uh, my mom was like, I don't have room for this like antique curio cabinet. Do not chew on my desk, Ruby. <laughs> Ruby's just chewing on my new desk. She's like, since we're talking about it, I might as well yeah. have a taste. Is um, this an invitation? <laughs> you can't, Ruby, I cannot wait to put you outside. Oh my goodness. But um. Anyway, so I got this curio cabinet um, that my mom was like, well, I'm not going to take it with me so you can have it if you want. And I was like, perfect. I'll store all my canned goods in it because I can stuff constantly because I hate letting Mm -hmm. stuff from the garden go bad. Um, And so I've just been stacking all of these jars on the counter and (laughs) it's been very messy. Yes. And so I'm like looking at it out of the corner of my eye and it looks so good. Like it looks like staged, like it looks like they're Mm. pumps, not like actual canned goods. Ruby, stop um sorry for ruby again and sorry for me y'all having to constantly listen to me say ruby stop but she's do not bite me she's always horrible during recording it's the worst ruby chill to knock it off ruby stop um but anyways so that happened and that's fun i have some writing updates finally that i'll save for the end but finally i have some writing updates (laughs) Um, and that's exciting. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, got some cool stuff on prime day for our guest room. Cause my brother is going to look at apartments in Houston tomorrow. Um, cool. so anyway, so that room will be when it's empty, will be, uh, returned to an office slash guest room. So, cool. and we're going to have a lot of people come out around the time of the baby shower. So we really need like a decent ish guest room. <laughs> Yeah. So (laughs) I'm like, okay, we used it as like a kind of like slap together office before, but I want it to not be like a really gross room for people to stay in. So Mm -hmm. we're like getting a new um, mattress for the futon and I got some pillows for the futon and I feel that that, that that's sufficient. I feel that that's what will really is going to make the room cozy. Futons make like like, impromptu guest rooms so as long as it exists exactly and then there's like a little bit of effort I think yeah (laughs) and like I'm just gonna make a tiny bit of effort I'm not great at interior design too which is why I just keep staring at my curio cabinet with my canned goods because it looks Mm -hmm. like a prop and I'm just like wow I can't believe I did that I can't (laughs) believe I'm so good at this (laughs) I am amazing at decor uh you guys can see like my bookshelf is not like really gorgeously um arranged there is a, it's an, a method to the madness my method yeah. but like if you guys can you guys can probably see out of the corner of Carissa's screen she has these gorgeously arranged bookshelves I can't yeah. show you all of them but yeah, yeah. but she's very my, good that's, at it that's my only interior decorating ability is I'm very good at bookshelves so I'm very good at organizing I'm not yeah. very good at like 
And now it looks really nice. Like you can mm -hmm. see, I have, my bookshelf is very organized. It's organized by genre. Yeah. Um, but at the very top, there is a ball, there's like a basket of, um, or like a little bag of dog toys because yeah, I had to put them that's out somewhere I thought, out of like, are those reach. tennis balls? <laughs> so it totally ruins the aesthetic of the bookshelf. And then my whiskey flask, um, mm. that is my, my firefly themed whiskey flask, which yeah. I love. And I just want to display and I, I pregnant so I can't drink right. whiskey and I'm not much of a flask carrier anyways I tend to follow so it's got to be on display that's its only uh, yeah, yeah that's the only place for it really <laughs> exactly so I'm I'm very pleased and I did steal another piece of my mom's furniture that she's like I will want that back and I was like well for now it's mine <laughs> and I put it, um, I put it in now. our room it's amazing and I stole her big tv and put the little one in the guest room or in the cool. in what's her room what will be the nursery um, mm -hmm. because with, I took the piece of furniture, the TV was on and none of the other furniture in the room can hold the big TV. So I'm like, well, I have to take the big TV because the, the big one doesn't fit in there. So obviously I have to, uh, but I mean, she's got TVs at her, the new house, so I don't think it matters at all. Um, but I'm just so satisfied with, cool. it's like, you know, like pregnant women, like nest, I can't yeah. nest. There's still no room to nest. And well, this my is baby like a shower is not nesting. for another. Exactly. So this is like my version of nesting is like getting everything organized in the way that I like it. And um, the baby shower is about a month away. So yeah. I hope you can come. Are you going to come? I, I still haven't gotten an invitation. I so know. I don't know when it is or anything. So it's the last Saturday of August. Okay. I'll do my best. It's okay. I will have. I will, I, are you obviously, cutting this? Yes. <laughs> you're making I, a note. <laughs> I am. It is. I obviously, you will get an invitation. You're obviously on okay. the list. Um, <laughs> I'm not in charge of sending the invitations. Yeah. So if it were me being hyper compulsively productive, I would have already sent them out. Um, as mm -hmm. it is, it's a little over a month away. So like, it's still within okay. boundaries. You know, I feel like giving people like a month's yeah. notice for a baby shower is fine. Um, sure. but my mom just texted me this morning. Ruby just pushed my chair out of the way of the microphone. Um, she's like, stop talking mom, unless it's to me. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so she was saying this morning that she's got a bunch of the details pinned down now. And so I'm like, great. So now are you going to send the invites? <laughs> Let <laughs> everyone know. <laughs> I'm like, I was thinking about this yes. earlier, either today or yesterday. And I was like, did they forget about me? Or no. like, was it pushed? Like they what's just happening? They haven't sent the invites and it's driving yeah. me crazy because I've had people ask about it. And I think thinking the same thing, like they're just not invited. And I'm like, no, you absolutely are invited. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not in charge of sending the invitations and right. it and I have no power over it. And like, part of me was like, oh, this will be nice. Cause my friend, Marissa, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she's got her mermaid event planning friend. business. Yes. My mermaid friend, Marissa, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's like a mermaid surfer themed baby shower. And I'm like, Marissa offered to do all of the event planning, like with my mom and sister. And I'm like, sure, this is going to be great. I love not having extra stuff to do, but I do have control problems in the sense that yeah. I can do everything better and faster than everybody else. And that sounds arrogant, but it is true. Like 90% of the time or more. So that was fair. <laughs> I'm like just sitting here like, have you sent the invitations? Have you sent the yeah. invitations? Have you sent the and I can't like and th I, this is just me in my own head because I can't ask because it's something they're doing like nicely for me. And like mm -hmm. they don't need to be doing this, like with their time and money. And so I'm like, you can't ask for anything. Like you have to just let them, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. And I'm like, but the invitations <laughs> you have to tell people. <laughs> like people want to know. I wanna know. <laughs> Like, and I want to have know. access to the invitation so I can forward it to someone. Cause I'm like, I have sent them a list of like 50 people. And then I keep, sometimes I'll be like, oh yeah. And that person. And I add them because mm. some people I know are not going to come, but I'm like, I at least want them to know that they're invited. Um, sure. but because I keep adding people, I feel like they're going to miss people. And I'm like, if you just give me the invitation, I will be able to know <laughs> that <Yeah>. everybody <laughs> has been invited. So sure. yeah. Anyways, so like that's. Know. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really bad at that. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm excited about the baby shower. I think about it a lot now. I think because it's like the next step in my nesting mode. I can't nest until I have more baby stuff. And I'm not yeah. going to buy my own baby stuff till I see um, after, after the baby shower. Because I'm like, I don't want to buy something somebody else is going to get. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. Ew, there's dog drool all over my leg now. Um, don't do it, yo. 
don't do it i mean she just licked my leg twice <laughs> so <laughs> gross anyways um i think that's it so it's just been lots of getting used to my new job and um mm-hmm organizing which makes me happy I organized all the dvds too I got a real filing cabinet and I got to organize all my files so that's nice because I was using like a file box which Mm -hmm. is okay but I'm like it works for a couple years but then yeah exactly exactly and I'm like I'm gonna have like baby's documents too and I'm like I don't trust myself not to lose important documents with this system I need an actual filing cabinet so yeah so I'm very pleased with myself feeling very adultish um cool. I also you know like I took clothes out of the dryer last night and folded them and put them away this morning which for me is like a Ooh. huge record like nice. <laughs> usually I let the clean laundry sit in the basket for about a week at least yeah so I felt very grown up cool yeah I yeah. washed my comforter today and I, I feel pretty good about that because I hadn't done that in a while so I was nice. like, oh, this is amazing I need to ours is like kind of a brownish hue from the sand mm-hmm. because Ruby will get up there And we're trying to teach her not to get on the bed anymore, largely because of that. And also because the baby's coming Um, because and also because she's in her teenager stage. So now she's like before it was like, I get to sleep with mom and dad. And now she's like, this is my bed. This is my (laughs) stuff. (laughs) I'm entitled to whatever I want. And I don't have Mm -hmm. to listen to anybody. And if I want to chew up the TV remote control, I'm gonna. And so (laughs) We had to buy a whole new one. Good girl, that is your toy. So now we're trying to like good girl when she uses a toy and not like a random object, but she is in full yep. teenager mode. So I'm like, nice. we're getting real strict right now. And hopefully we can relax the rules a little bit when she is through this phase, but right. she's being a punk. So anyways, that's that. I keep saying anyways, that's that. That's anyways. it. That's my week. Uh, or that's been my last two weeks. There's just a lot of things and my brain is scattered most of the time. So yeah. Yep. That. Um, but what about book recs? Do you have any book recs you want to share with the peeps? I do. I'm so Ooh. excited about this. My reading slump is over. Are oh, you ready ow. for a veritable slurry of book recommendations? I have so many. Okay. Really? So, okay. Yeah. Well, this is great because I don't have any. I okay, good. Water bottle. So, I mean, not good that you haven't been reading, but good because I'm going to try not to take up an enormous amount of time. But okay, so <laughs> I finished Aurora's End, which is the third book of the Jamie Kaufman, J. Kristoff Aurora Cycle sci-fi right. series. And it was really good. I was right. It was pretty good. Um, <laughs> I just had to be mentally ready for it. Um, and so that's really fun. So if you guys really like sci-fi, I would I would go with that one for sure. Um, then I read, if you guys noticed the Catherine's Corner episode from last week, I read The Shadows Between Us by mm-hmm. Trisha Levenseller, I think is how you say her name. And she wrote The Daughter of the Pirate King, I think, was her original series, if you guys have heard of that one. And I have not read those. But apparently, this is off topic, but there are like these new fancy covers of those books. And like they have the sprayed pages and like fancy new covers. And now I want those. Even oh though I've my not gosh. Read them, but yeah, I haven't read them either, really but cool. I've seen the covers and that sounds amazing. They God, are I beautiful. love sprayed edges. I don't want to hear from you guys if you don't like sprayed edges. I saw someone say that once and I what? am still upset about it. It was years ago. They were like, you know, it's overdone sprayed edges. And I was like, you're overdone. Get off my feet. Never. <laughs> you know, it's overdone. Your opinion. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> um, yeah. Sprayed edges are amazing. I do mm-hmm. love them. Um, but anyway, The Shadows Between Us was shockingly good. I don't, it's not that I wasn't expecting it to be good. It just wasn't what I was expecting, if that makes sense. So like, you guys can listen to the episode if you want to know more and stuff, but it was pretty good. I liked it. Um, and it's solidly YA, which I did not think it was going to be. So I thought Ooh. it was going to be more NA. So yeah. anyway, I, I'm now thinking I might be a general fan of hers. We'll see how Ooh, further uh, follow-up books go, but we'll see. That's fun. Um, then I read uh, The Ballad of Never After, which is book two in the Once Upon a Broken Heart series by Stephanie Garber, which is the sequel series to Caraval, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> if that made sense. And it was also really good and I really enjoy it. And if you guys have read any of those books, I really like Jax, which is crazy because he is a bad boy. He's one of the few bad that boys I really crazy. like. And it's probably because he's pseudo blonde. So <laughs> maybe that's I, the real issue I have. <laughs> is he really a bad boy? Because he sometimes is. you call a guy a bad boy and I don't think he is. Sometimes his hair is blue. Does that help? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Okay. 
<laughs> anyway, he is. He um have you read Caraval? I read Caraval. Yeah. Okay. Do you know who you know who Jax is then? He's the uh Prince He's of Harps the... fate. Is he the... the primary love interest? No. He's He's one of the fates, right? Which is like their god system. And he's the one, the Prince of Hearts, where like he, oh, his yes. kiss kills, except yeah. when he finds his true love. And then his heart will start to beat and he can kiss her without killing her and stuff. Yeah. So he's one of the. Is he more uh, in the second book? Because I mean, like, I, he's yeah. not a big character in Caraval, is he? See, I don't remember now. He He's a bit. A, a decently big part of the third book. That's what I remember. Okay. The most. I don't think he's um, a big part of Caraval if he's mentioned because yeah. he is a love interest in the sequel series, though. Um, and he's 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 like you know untrustworthy and mysterious, but like he he kind of likes her, but he doesn't want to like her. And I really like that. What does Ruby yeah. have? <laughs> is a problem. A toy. That a toy. Bad girl. No. <laughs> I don't even know what this is i just know it's not a toy let's see it's a mystery yeah. bag it's got ooh, <laughs> like jacks brain quest you know like the chick-fil-a games they used to um give yeah. out and <laughs> we have like a bunch of them in here that's adorable that's so nice cute. no ruby um <laughs> so yeah Jax is a great character and i like him a lot i actually like all the characters in the sequel series which is rare not for a sequel series just to like everyone like everyone yeah. is no one is um like fat on the meat if that makes sense right no one's extremely yeah, yeah. everyone has a role and i really I love like that. it so anyway ballad of never after is really good i would definitely recommend the series and um the third book comes out i think in october so now i'm waiting for that Ooh, <laughs> I, oh i love an october my list. release my baby yeah. will also be released in october That's right. <laughs> <laughs> coming this october coming um this october the dragon curse of Slayer something O'Rourke. the curse of dragon Slayer yeah O'Rourke. and the baby <laughs> that's yes combine the two (laughs) i love it (laughs) um so yeah so i also read those anyway what else did i read oh okay so i also read gilded and cursed by marissa meyer which Uh is her new rumpelstiltskin retelling yes oh my gosh it's so good she marissa meyer is just amazing she She never fails i i started reading it and there were a couple things at the beginning where i was like "Mm, i don't know if i'm liking this and then, you know, I got like 50 pages in and I was like, oh, no, definitely, definitely liking this. And so yeah. definitely by the, uh, the end of Curse, which is the second book. And it's a duology. So it's just the two. Um, I was like, this is fantastic. I love it. I'm going to do a Catherine's Corner episode on most of these. So I'm trying not to talk about them too much. Um, so those will be coming in, in wow. the coming weeks slash months. Um, but yeah, Gilded by Marissa Meyer. Definitely recommend. I loved those. Um, and then... <laughs> I also then, read oh my god um, excellent I know I also read foul lady fortune which is by Ooh, Chloe Gong I'm like sure her I'm name saying. yeah so she wrote these violent delights which you guys have probably right. seen around it's the Romeo and Juliet retelling that I think takes place in Shanghai 1930s or 1920s um I did not know foul lady fortune is actually also a sequel series to those books so I've been like sort of spoiled except it's hard to be spoiled for something based on Romeo and Juliet because like I know how it's gonna end uh so I mean I'm not too upset about it I could read them now and I don't think it would change much um but yeah I don't know if it's based on anything but I also really enjoyed that one and like historical fiction with a twist of sci-fi which is different than what i normally read so i liked it yeah and that second book i think also comes out in october or soonish <gasps> another october so, release oh i love yeah. it i just want I october to get here so bad i know if, if we could just skip ahead that'd be great if we could that'd be fantastic yeah and i think that's all of them that's all i've read um that's it huh that's, that's all it. you've read in the last two weeks that's all i got wow, i told you guys once, once my reading slump is over i will be set so now I, I just have all these files on my computer that i'm like writing the Catherine's corner episodes for for all yeah. these books i've read i'm like i am set for months so that is amazing yeah that's hilarious that's but, awesome yeah i, I just I hit like so many in a row so that this is yeah. nice because I can I I feel like less of a Sit disappointment because I can just yeah. like bathe in the afterglow of your success. <laughs> Gosh, I'm so happy to be out of the reading slump. And here's the thing. So I'm super behind on my Goodreads goal, 
which I always set for a hundred. And then I try to get to 101 because I like to overachieve. Um, but when I was in this reading slump, as of one week ago, I was at 13. Uh-huh. Um, so I have six months to get to 100. And I don't know that that's going to happen, but it will be less embarrassing than it otherwise <laughs> would have been. That's true. So, you know, I we'll think see. you're good, we'll you know, and you've written yeah. so much. It's not like you've not been doing you know. anything. I I actually have been reading a book um, slowly, but which mm-hmm. is so not like me, but I'm just trying to find time to read when I can. I don't yeah. remember the name of it right now, which I know is horrible, um, but it's one of those books like I just had on my shelf forever. I don't even know where it came from. It's obviously a yeah. library copy of a book. So I probably oh. got it like a, at a used bookstore or something mm-hmm. um, because sometimes like people don't turn in their library books and eventually they're like, oh, I still have this. And they give it to like Goodwill or something. Um, yeah. It's fantasy. I think it's a retelling of 12 Dancing Princesses. I don't remember what it's called or who it's by because it's been on my shelf for so long. I just stopped paying attention to the title. I was just like, oh, I'm going to read that one. This and one, I got to get it off here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. what I did. So it's yeah. good so far. I'll give you guys an update um, when I actually finish it. But uh, luckily, you don't have to wait for any book recs because Chris has got Sorry. you now. I got all of the book recs. And I have... Um... A couple more series that have been on my to be read shelf that I'm now going to finally get to. Like I'm going to read City of Brass hopefully soon, and I'm going to read If We Were Villains soon. <gasps> so yeah! hopefully read that I one next. That I know. one is so good. Oh I my forgot God. about it because I had it under. So at the beginning of the year, I think I decided to read Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, and like, oh my gosh, it's so boring. So I I had that one on top of If We Were Villains, and then I had a couple notebooks, and then I had Aurora's oh, no. End because I had that I like halfway done for months. So they were all on top of each other, and so I finished Aurora's End, and I was like, oh my gosh, things underneath this book. What is this? And I found If We Were Villains. So nice, it's back. Well, I'm uh, glad. So, yeah. Thank goodness. I've only been telling you to read it forever. Yeah. I know. It's so, so good. And I will say this, normally I don't read books like the year they come out because I wait for them to get cheaper, right? Same. So Same. I, I'm i not great at keeping up with trends like as they happen. I kind of see, and I mean, that's not true. Trends aren't only year by year, but um, it's, I now feel like I have options as I read more recent releases for like comp titles and my queries which is really helpful because for the past year or so, whenever I've been querying, I have to like look up the release date because it's supposed to be within five years uh, if you're going to comp it. So I'm like, Uh ah, that's five and a half. I guess it works. (laughs) So I've been kind of- I've never checked that before. Yeah, I do. I'm, I know they probably don't care. I don't think it's a hard and fast rule to do five years. If it's six years and it really fits, that's probably fine because they just want it to be recent. But now I can feel like, okay, things released in the past two years I have read now, so I can talk about those. I think Fat yeah. Lady Fortune actually came out less than a year ago, so yay for me. Ooh, what are you drinking? Water. Oh, same. We match. <laughs> Good for us. I do also have in this other mug Dr. Pepper, but it's not Ooh. what I was drinking right gotcha. then. So. <laughs> gotcha. I, yeah. this is not on topic, but I don't care. Here's, here's just like one more reason to add to the many reasons I can't wait for fall. I mean, like there's not a single bad thing about fall this year for me, knock on wood. I mean, and also yep. I'll be able to drink again, which is so exciting. Like I wasn't a heavy drinker to begin with, but like something about like a, like a spiced hot toddy in the fall or like a, are you not going to breastfeed? No, I am, but you can still drink and breastfeed. You, you can just have, have to like pump. a, that's right. Well, it depends how much. So like you can have like oh, two glasses okay. of wine, like an hour to the part, you know, like you'd have like two glasses of wine at dinner and you could still breastfeed. Um, okay. Yeah. But if you have, you know, you know that, better than me. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just looking this up the other day. Cause I was like, how much am I? I'm I so know, excited like, for you fall. Can have, like, <laughs> I didn't Ruby stop. I, I was looking it up the other day because I was like, I know I can drink, but I don't remember if it's like half a glass of wine and that's it. You know, no, it's like two glasses of wine and then you're good. And then if you have more than that, you have to pump and dump, which mm. I, right. I'm going to try to avoid. But I also I don't typically have more than two drinks anyways at most. So like I said, right. I'm not a heavy drinker. So I just I'm excited to get my like spiked peppermint hot chocolate or my hot yeah. toddy and it's going to be so nice and everything pumpkin flavored is going to come out. I just can't wait. And all Yay. of you are like, it's July. It's the <laughs> end of July. That's okay. Right. Okay. And kids are closer about to than back the beginning. To school, so we're closer to the right. end of summer than the beginning of summer, which 
and thank god it's so hot here it's horrible (laughs) i hate it we've only had one big storm normally we get monsoons like in july Uh we've had one big storm i'm like come on i just wanted to storm for the rest of july that's all i want yeah, we so. usually get a few good storms during the summer too. And we're in a stage two drought right now because we have not had <sighs> rain for so long. So I'm like having yeah. to like really, I have to like follow like all these like specific rules about watering the garden and stuff. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's a bummer. I mean, I, I don't know why I'm telling you, Arizona definitely knows drought also. <laughs> just we so do. We bummed. are very prepared for it though. Like yeah. a lot of other places across the country will be like, it hasn't rained in a month. What do we do? And Arizona's like, we're good for two years if we don't get a drop of rain. Like we plan ahead <laughs> so far just in case. Yeah. So. Texas does not plan ahead that far. I think that we yeah. probably plan ahead like six months, you know. Um, we do there. So my parents are building a house. And in order to build a house, part of the like construction approval process is that you have to prove a water supply for like the next hundred years. So you have to say like we like the indoor plumbing will work and you can have all of these kinds of like flood barriers and stuff like that water will not be an issue for the next hundred years in order to build. So you have to have like I I don't know fully how it works, but essentially you have to go to like whoever controls the water in in Tucson (laughs) and say like, can you provide for this house? (laughs) Yeah, God, you can let it rain. Um, But yeah, you have to say like can you provide for this house for the next hundred years? And they have to say yes before you can build because it's such an issue wow. here that you might need a drought. So I love that they are so on top of it though. See, that feels I like know. a good regulation. Usually I hear regulations and I'm like, that's dumb. I'm like, that feels right. very smart. Good job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And my, so also random thing, uh, we are going to be outside the technical city limits which means that we can't rely on the fire department in the same way, which means that we are going to have an internal sprinkler system instead of uh, like, fire. I mean, I guess we'll probably still have smoke alarms, but is that like a regulation or is that just y'all being smart? No, that's a regulation. You have to have the sprinklers because you're outside. <gasps> we don't the have that limits. regulation here. That sounds amazing. Yeah. So oh my God, I think it's totally because need that. <laughs> I know I think it's because we're farther we're going to be farther from the fire department. So you have yeah. to have some kind of fire control in that. Sense, yeah. So. Well, that makes sense. I'm fire like, we're fun. really far from the fire department. Yeah. We are not in city limits. <laughs> that yeah. is not a concern here. Apparently, I'm like, yeah, I guess there's a smoke detector ripped off the wall right there. God, like, <laughs> we <laughs> might be okay in case of fire who knows <laughs> this house is a death trap i swear oh my god anyways um, uh yeah, what about anyway. our word of the week word of the week woo i think this is also a verb i don't know why i was struggling last last word of the week was a verb which is why i said also in case you guys haven't been paying attention um i don't know why i'm struggling so hard to tell what part of speech this is but i think it's a verb so it's let's see bowdler eyes Bowdlerize. Okay, so B O W D L E R I Z E. I pronounce it thinking of Bowser from the Mario <laughs> game. So uh-huh. Bowdlerize. It is to remove material that is considered improper or offensive from a text or account, especially when it weakens the work, or to remove vulgar references. Censorship. So, yeah, basically, <laughs> you Bowdlerize it. So, like, I heard that they were doing this with Roll Doll books recently in the UK where oh. um he has he has some uh you know he has you know, the witches are called fat and some mm-hmm. some people are called ugly oh, and so they right. I heard about this they they've been removing it. those so technically yeah. they're bowdlerizing it exactly yeah I think so. if we're gonna listen I don't approve of censorship so I definitely am, am not in favor of the bowdlerization of anything uh, I did mm-hmm. make up that word and I, I it feels like a right word to say and I'm gonna stick mm-hmm. with it um but if we're gonna bowdlerize something, I I vote for the bowdlerization of all of Roald Dahl's works. I hate it. I hate Roald Dahl's works. It's, I haven't read I them in the so long. Illustrations too. I just well, we I read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory last year, mm. and I yeah, you've I read hate one more the recently. witches storyline. I just I don't remember them being that bad. So when I heard about it, I was like, that seems silly. Why waste time on that? But I, I, it's been so long since I've read a Roald Dahl I book, don't so. remember it, it, my my. My decision to personally bowdlerize Roald Dahl in my home is not because of anything offensive in it. It's because I just don't like Roald Dahl. <laughs> it's not Fair a enough. very popular opinion, but I just, mm-hmm. I don't like Roald Dahl. I don't like the illustrations. I don't really like the storylines. They're just like, it's so weird because I'm a totally nonsensical person, but these are like a few steps too nonsensical for me. 
um mm. they feel dumb it reminds me of ed ed and eddie that stupid stupid tv oh, show yeah to me I it strikes it. the same chord and that right. might be totally unfair but for some reason it does and so i hate it so i personally will bowdlerize roll doll but i am not in favor of actual bowdlerization right good yeah. that seems correct that seems yeah. fair doesn't it <laughs> um on the roll doll thing real fast it was so funny because when i was younger i didn't really like matilda which is crazy uh-huh. because she's a book reader and she has telekinesis, which is the power I would want if I had magic. But for some yeah. reason, I didn't like that book. So maybe you that's why. Maybe it was just Matilda too energy. I know. Yeah. So, but I don't. And I, I didn't do have love to it. say the cinematic adaptations of some of Roald Dahl's work is fine. The Matilda mm-hmm. movie, fine. The Matilda musical, adorable. The Willy, not Willy Wonka, the Chocolate Factory, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie. The Willy Wonka one with Johnny Depp was creepy, I felt. But the Charlie and the Chocolate, it's creepy. (laughs) The Charlie and the Chocolate Factory one, it was fine. I still don't, everyone loves Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I just don't. And I never have, ever. I do like Um, that one, but. It's fine. Like the cinematic adaptations, I don't have the same problems with. But I, mm -mm, nope, don't like the book. Mm -hmm. I I, I vote to Bowdlerize. Yeah, they're babblerizing those in the UK. If anyone wants some suit, some Maybe somewhat I should move censored to the UK. Uh, UK, if I could yeah, convince them versions. to babblerize every word of the books, not just the ones that they deem offensive, just change them entirely and then smack yes. his name on top, <laughs> or just even his name. We could just babblerize his name too. We could just the whole thing. Say Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by who knows? <laughs> no, we can even babblerize the title. It'll just be, it'll just be like an empty, but it'll be a note, like an empty book, like a notebook. And someone else can write a much better story in it. You know, you can write your own version <laughs> of <Yeah>. the tale. <laughs> exactly. But I would pick a better yeah. concept because he picks weird concepts. Can you guys tell I don't like Roald Dahl? <laughs> they are weird when you think about it. like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory has been so much. It's been around my whole life, so it doesn't feel weird. But it it is, it is weird. so weird. It's a very book about weird. a chocolate factory where kids disappear, and then it's totally normal. <laughs> and the Oompa Loompas and like yeah. the weird things that candy can do, and like mm-hmm. just like the weird things that are just like accepted as normal, even about like Charlie's life and his family. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that's not normal. All his grandparents live in the same bed and they yeah, never in the leave. Same bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, this doesn't feel accurate can you imagine i'm not a parent and i'm certainly not a parent of a married child but can you imagine sharing a bed with your in-laws <laughs> that would be so weird <laughs> that would be very weird i that's guess it depends how well you get along with them like is it yeah, like a true. fun sleepover situation <laughs> or is it like i'm not talking to barbara like you know she's like right across the bed from you and over to barbara who's like four feet away <laughs> not yeah, even exactly yeah barbara and i are in the middle of a fight right now so we're not talking to each other <laughs> would make a really know. funny play so it would. fair enough <laughs> roll doll it was entertaining but i guess there was some strange. entertaining elements roll doll but i still vote for uh to bowdlerize your stuff yep and i don't take it back <laughs> and i don't care that it's All unreasonable right. <laughs> Also, I think you've pretty much been using this word correctly the entire time. I keep trying to so, find a way to use it wrong, and it's actually really it. hard to use this word wrong. It's a lot harder. Yeah. It's a lot easier to use this word correctly. It is. It's already a strange word. Yeah, I'm having a really hard time like trying to like turn it into an adjective. It sounds like something Lewis Carroll would write in Alice in Wonderland, and you read it, and you're like, "Is that made up or is that real?" Because yes, can't that's tell. exactly that's exactly what this word feels like. Yeah, you you picked a good one. Nice work. <laughs> no. Like I'm proud to have found a second verb in a row because, like I said yeah. last time, it's hard to find good words, uh, verbs. I don't think that this is the kind of verb you're gonna find useful in the everyday uh, for no. your writing, but it's there if it is useful one day. Yeah, so. we typically just call it censorship. But if, you, if you're ever trying to be sneaky and get people to be on board with censorship who aren't, you can make it sound more fun and call it valorize. Right. Sounds a, whimsical. That's, that's for all you politicians out there. Hot tip. Yeah. Some of us don't like censorship. That's okay. Just rebrand it. You love to do that. <laughs> That's basically what politicians are for. Woo. It's literally the whole, their whole shtick. <laughs> yeah. So Ugh. that's for all you politicians out there. Mm-hmm. That one's for you guys. You're welcome. It didn't mean to help you, but there it is. But here we are. <laughs> and the rest of you guys have just been informed. So beware mm-hmm. someone tries to trick you. And they're like, exactly. no, 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 I'm not for censorship. I'm for bowdlerization. And you're like, like, that's oh. the same you'd be thing. Like, I know what it is. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Like, for example, did you know, and this is not me making a political statement. I just thought this was shocking when I found this out. Um, 
I don't know if I've already told you this or not. Uh, so this might not be as an exciting of a reveal if I have already told you. But um, you know, like the AR and like AR-15. Do you know what the mm-hmm. AR stands for? Not assault rifle. Nope, not assault. <laughs> you guys, it doesn't stand for assault rifle. It stands for Arm- Ar- Armalite rifle, which was the original brand okay. that made a certain kind of weapon. Right. Um, and in fact, assault rifle is actually a made up term. Hitler made up that term to try and make uh, as propaganda to try and make the ar- their army sound um, scarier to make them sound more intimidating. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that was just that was shocking to find out. So that was another that was just made me think of that. Like, that's a fun one where I'm like, at what point did this just become? Let's don't let this happen. We just to accepted this lie. We just accepted <laughs> that this lie. I did too. Yep. And then mm-hmm. I was shocked to find that out. And also to find out that if you talk to someone who actually uses weapons and you're like, oh yeah, an assault rifle, they're like, what is, that's not, what are you talking about? That's it's not, not an thing. actual oh, thing. Eye roll. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, look at this kid. Am I right? <laughs> no, because like my husband, he's a, he's a mortarman in the army. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, guns and ammunition, those are like his specialty and he's been doing it forever. And he's like, that's not a thing. That's not a type of rifle that's it's a made-up mm-hmm. term and it's really crazy. who would call it that except for someone trying to sound dangerous right like, exactly that's, In retrospect, there's no reason to call it that it makes so much sense but see now you guys know that and now you guys know that if somebody tries to convince you to get on board with battlerization they're trying to convince you to get on board with censorship so mm-hmm. you're welcome the more you know <laughs> yep yep anyways do you want to get into uh the theme for this episode yeah so if you guys have been around for any period of time, you know that Ash and I are both Christians. Woo! Mm-hmm. So ow, ow. we're gonna... <laughs> for so many ones that were out out for that. Yay, Jesus. Um, <laughs> so we're Hallelujah. gonna talk about there we go. Uh some specific tips for Christians out there who uh want to write in genres other than the Christian market, right? Yes. So if you're not a Christian, you can stay tuned. Some of these might be applicable to you. We'll see. Um, and if you are a Christian, you are in the right place because yes. this is specifically for you. It's so. very true. If you are someone, if you're not Christian, but you are someone who's like, I really want to get my these important like moral or philosophical mm. themes or messages across in your book. This is probably yeah. also the episode for you because it's the same. It's yeah. the same strategies typically that these that, you know, these writers use, whether they identify as religious or not. Um, mm-hmm. and some of them, most of the strategies that people typically use are just the antithesis of good writing, which yeah. is unfortunate. <laughs> and I see where they get, why they get there and, and like what gets them there, but there's a much better way. And that's what we're going to talk about. So, yep. So welcome yeah. to welcome our to this slightly religious episode, to a semi-religious uh-huh. episode where we... <laughs> Where we can kind of make fun of, uh, just kidding. We're not going to make fun of you guys. We're all, we're both Christian, also. We're just yeah. all seriously. It's just um, the things that you learn. And it, here's the thing: is bad Christian fiction is so laughable. Okay, and you guys can't be offended by that. You have to admit it is. It's it hurts. It's so cringy. It's physically painful. Unless you're yeah. someone like Kendall, my co-host over at that pretentious book club, because she can laugh at, she can like at the stuff where you like cringe from embarrassment, secondhand embarrassment. She doesn't get that. So she can just laugh. So unless oh, you're geez. someone like what her, a life she must lead. <laughs> right. I'm like, life sounds more fun for you. I yeah. guess secondhand embarrassment bad, but either way that um, is often the result of Christians writing any type of fiction in any genre. Um, mm-hmm. Rarely done. Well, um, that does not mean it cannot be done. Well, look at, uh, c.s lewis and tolkien are our nickname namesakes um mm-hmm. and don't anyone there out there try and be like the lord of the rings wasn't wasn't religious okay talk it had very very heavy religious okay. um whatever <laughs> okay <So> boomer <laughs> <laughs> no you guys can look into tolkien's life and his faith was very important to him and there's definitely even if he didn't write it intentionally there are like you know themes of very important themes of good and evil and lord of the rings was also not the only thing he wrote but that to say to bring up those examples um christian writers can be amazing and i mean Mm -hmm. if you think about it the whole kind of crux of the christian bible relies on this belief in a creator god right so like a god with the imagination like with an imagination that has no bounds that can create Mm -hmm. worlds upon worlds and people and there's just no limit and it's a storyteller by nature and then in the new testament 
I mean, also, and this is also culturally, because at the time, that's how parables, parables were normal across, you know, all religions for, you know, communicating messages. But it just goes to show how important storytelling has been always culturally across the board. And but specifically to Christians, um, imagination, creativity, creating things, storytelling, that is integral to our faith, if you think about it. And um, Mm -hmm. so you would think that we would be better at doing this in a more yeah. um <clears throat> of what's the word I'm looking for like in a more relatable way um yeah. but we for the most part do not hit the mark yeah I feel like the reason for that is probably laziness and I know no yeah. one wants to hear that but I think but it's, it's true I think Christians sometimes think oh well I'm right and I have this good message so I don't need to put that much effort into it it'll come across and yes. like that doesn't work for anything on planet earth no <laughs> like, do you think no effort not. was put into the bible like uh, of course tons of a lot of effort was put into writing the bible so right and it was effort. divinely inspired so if you're yes. not divinely inspired you need to be putting more effort into it yeah um so oh my gosh anyway, yeah I don't necessarily I, I do want to go on a tangent about that but yeah but that's true I do think that that's probably <laughs> yeah. the root cause of a lot of it is um either laziness or a belief that what you have to say is so important that the craft is not as important that you can just right. skate by and you know God I think is like you know carry it on for you and I don't think yeah. that that's true it's I will go back to the parable that I think I referenced last episode because I actually <laughs> think I mentioned parables last episode you need mm-hmm. to be diligent with the brain that God gave you with the skills right. at your with your fingertips, with the expertise that you can lean on, that you can learn about, be diligent with your talents and use them to yep. the best of your abilities. Don't just slap a book together and be like, well, the message is good and that's all that matters. So God is going yeah. to bless this endeavor. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, mm-hmm. is it Tim Hawkins that has that joke about like sitting around a table eating Cheetos and Dr. Pepper and saying, <laughs> God, please let this nourish my body yes bless this food <laughs> change the, the of molecular our body. structure <laughs> of this like car- swallow t- this food <laughs> is this you know and turn it into a carrot stick on the way yeah. down yes that is so it's funny like that, but for writers <laughs> that is exactly what it is that was such a good and timely reference that's exactly what yeah. i think happens often for mm-hmm. christian religious or even just like um not overly philosophical but like motivated by morality and philosophy mm-hmm. type authors so and the thing is that's just not going to happen that's silly it's a silly thing to think (laughs) it has to be good on its own it It has to be good on its own you can't expect supernatural interference from god i mean you can believe in miracles but i don't think he's necessarily going to use one to change the syntactical structure of your book so no i think he has more important things to do and then also it wouldn't be your book so yeah that's anyways um so where do you what do you want to do you want to start with specific genres or problems or solutions? Do you I had kind of some like just general things. So do you have specific things for genres that you want to talk about? Um, I was just gonna say that I think it's uh often a little more difficult in not fantasy necessarily if you know how to use allegory. Allegory mm-hmm. is you I mean regardless across the board, allegory is an amazing tool. Um and yes use it and yes you can use very veiled allegory don't be like oh is it too vague it's not too vague okay it's not too vague um right don't don't make it really obvious because then it might as well you might as well not be using an allegory (laughs) if it's that obvious um Mm -hmm. but yeah allegory is an amazing tool to use no matter the genre but especially for fantasy if you're trying to get across a religious moral philosophical um message um and then sci-fi is very hard to do there is a series that I'm going to try and I'll look it up on my phone here in a minute and see if I can find it that I felt like did a really good job um, of this considering it's also it's like a middle grade series and it was mm-hmm. adorable the day star series or something I'll look it up um, but I thought it did a really good job and it's and it would still be hokey probably if you weren't like Christian but I think like a Christian middle schooler would really enjoy it and wouldn't feel that it's very hokey um Mm -hmm. but they actually do end up mentioning god but even even in that one it is so 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 rare typically i want to say that in any genre you you don't need to mention god by name for people to know what you're talking about um right and if when you do it kind of just feels like clanging symbols which is another biblical (laughs) reference but it just feels like you're smacking them on the head with the bible they're like i know what you're trying to say and that's the mm-hmm. other part of, um, I think, us religious people and also the people who are really philosophical tend to think that we know more than everyone else. 
And so um, we assume that, you know, by that logic that readers are dumber than us. So we have to explain mm-hmm. more to them. That's right. not true. So yeah, do, don't do that. <laughs> respect your reader's intelligence always and go for the vaguer thing or go for the allegory, the thing that you're like, oh, will they get it or won't they get it? If they want to read it for the deeper layer, they'll get it. If they don't, exactly. they should still get a good story and they shouldn't mm-hmm. be talked down to because they'll hate it. And also it's bad craft. That's, yeah, um, that's, that's basically my thoughts on the genres. Yeah, well, to add to that, I do think that um, uh, as an as a writer who is also Christian or religious in some way, you have to decide, am I writing specifically for the Christian market or am mm-hmm. I writing for everyone? And you are going to write that differently. Now, if you're writing in the Christian market, yes, you still need to have high quality and it still needs to be good and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. if you are writing outside of it, you want to make sure that someone is still getting a good story, even if they're not getting those themes. And I do think that's somewhat a problem is that Christian writers will kind of embed um, like the specific discussion about God, right? They'll use his name or they'll have a very specific biblical concept that comes up. And it's just not as relatable or accessible to people that like don't read the Bible or don't believe that. And so it can really pull them out of it. And if you're writing for the Christian market, that's fine because probably non-Christians aren't going to pick that book up unless they, you know, are just like exactly. in the wrong section of the bookstore. Well, that's story. why that, that but... sci-fi middle grade series, it was published yeah. by Moody Publishing, which is a Christian yeah. publisher. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was published specifically because for a very tiny target market of mm-hmm. Christian middle schoolers. <laughs> and right. so exactly. it, hit, it hit good. But even mm-hmm. in that scenario, the mentions of God and faith and religion were so light. And the right. focus of the story was the story. So, yeah. well, you want to give people, even middle schoolers, you want to yeah. give them the excuse. I don't know if that's the right word, but you want to force them to use their brain a little bit because mm-hmm. this is something that really frustrates me sometimes about the way that Christians are talked about and the way that Christians talk about themselves is yeah. somehow people are under the impression that Christians are just like, dumb and they don't, don't think things through. And they're like, oh, this is just, you know, people, you know, uh, what is the term? Uh, superstitious. Superstitious yeah. people in the past believed this way. They're just following that. They don't want to think it through. And mm-hmm. like the, the entire education system is based off of like Christianity. Like Harvard was originally a monastery. Mm-hmm. That's like Christians are the original intellectuals. And yeah. I don't think people remember that or also get that. The original or feminists. That. I know people, I know that yeah. we, we went away from that a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's but so originally. many of these like... <laughs> Yeah, so many of these movements were done by great thinkers were Christian movements or done by people that read the Bible and said, hey, if this is true, then we need to change been, this. Yeah, historically very radical. It, for most mm-hmm. of history, it's been the more radical choice. Um, you yeah. would have you would have called them, you would have called it the progressive group, you know, like it would have been yeah. the progressives with new ideas yep. and challenging the way things were done. It's only very so, recently and it only, I mean, in America and maybe some more yeah. Western countries where it's not been the case. And the hard part is I do think a lot of American Christians are just nominal Christians, which means they're just Christians in name. They don't actually believe or think about it very hard. So Mm -hmm. they're not really thinking these things through. But if you are a Christian, you should be thinking these things through. You should have something deep to say, not just something to say. And so if you're going to be communicating with readers, whether they believe what you believe or whether they don't, giving them food for thought and giving them you know, prompting them to critical thinking, I think is kind of an inherent, uh, that has to be your goal. If you're going to be a Christian and a writer, if you're going to be Christian in anything, you should really be prompting thought. You should be encouraging people Mm -hmm. to think it through for themselves because people don't get like in the Christian worldview, people don't get to heaven on coattails, right? They have to get there themselves. So you need to be prompting them to think it through and get there themselves, not just like get them bare minimum where you want them to be. So you have to be prompting that kind of thought. So I agree. I also, I think anyway. it applies to, even if you're not like writing from Christianity, I think whatever you believe, and we've talked about this a lot, you really have to be able to back it up. Like, don't just, mm-hmm. you know, say, this is what I'm going to write about because it's an important message that I hear in the media. And I agree. Why do you agree? What do you agree with about it? What challenges does this, you know, stance take? Like, what what is it? What challenges this way of thinking? Because there's always mm-hmm. challenges. Like, you need to really deeply understand whatever point you're making. 
um, religious or moral, philosophical, whatever, you need to understand it from all sides before you try and incorporate it into your book, which is, I think, another way that a lot of Christian writers just fall flat. They're like, I kind mm-hmm. of understand, you know, good's better than yeah. evil. I got that. God, good, Satan, bad, done. Right. No, you need to. Also, that's way too broad, which is another mm-hmm. problem, I think, that Christian writers, but also people who write with like, a, I'm, I'm on a mission, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, they tend to pick something that's way too broad. And just like with a theme, you have to be specific. You need to be specific about what you're trying to get across. Not God, good, Satan, bad. That's too broad. What do you yeah. want to talk about? Do you want to talk about, do you want to get across um, the message of like the value of human life? Like, do you want to pick something really specific like that? Do you want to make a point about um, (laughs) coffee was trying to catch Caleb's attention because there's pizza and Caleb Ah. totally missed it. Anyways, um, do you want to make a point about the way that um, spouses should treat each other? The Bible talks Mm -hmm. about that. Like, do you like what do you want specifically? And a great way to pick that is to actually decide your story first. And I think this is where. I think that this is where we could, as Christian writers and writers with missions, avoid a lot of the like instinctual pitfalls that happen in this realm is like make a great story first, like out, like either outline it or brainstorm or whatever, you know, and be like, this is a solid plot and then think, okay, what moral challenges, what emotional mental challenges are my characters going through in this book and how can my belief system, how does my belief system affect that? you know? Mm -hmm. And so then you can see the characters making the right choices according to that belief system, the wrong choices according to that belief system, and you can see the consequences. And I think that that, I mean, that is a way more effective way to tell in a great story, respect your reader's intelligence and actually say something meaningful because you have to deeply understand an issue to write that way. So Mm -hmm. I think that that could just have a good story first. Don't pick your message and then build around the message. I think there's very, right. very few writers that can do that without sounding That's hard. so boxy. I, I, that just seems like the opposite of instinctual. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I guess this is a separate tip, but related tip. So um, you as the writer also need to be a critical thinker and you need to be thinking through, like you said, why do I believe this? What do I believe about this? And think about it maybe like 10 steps deeper than yep. you strictly have to, right? Because- the more you know, and the more you kind of integrate that into your own way of thinking, it's going to come out in the plots you write anyway. It's kind of, yes. you're going to, you know, set it, uh, set up the plot and then you're going to say, okay, well, how can I make this, you know, work this according to my worldview? And you're going to find it's probably already there yeah, um, because it's just inherent in you at this point. So being a good thinker outside of being a writer is really important. So like being a good Christian thinker, yes. um, this is why I try to read some nonfiction books every so often, even though it's not like my absolute favorite thing to do, watch like documentaries or look up some kind of subject of interest, because the more critically you can think through um, the controversial issues and the non-controversial issues and get, like I said, deeper into them than maybe you strictly have to, to be a Christian, the more it's going to come out in your writing. And yeah. really like the idea of art and for our purposes here, writing in particular, is that you want to have deeper thought than strictly necessary. You want to encourage yeah. people to think, you want to give them multiple avenues that they can think through. Um, you don't want to just present the answer, like you said, on a soapbox and just say, here's what you should believe. Here's what yeah. we all believe. You should be leading people maybe to a, a certain conclusion that you want them to have, but leading them there in a way that makes sense and gives them potential like branches, right? Where they can say, I don't know if I agree with that. What do I think? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I mean, I think just to like really hammer that point home, I was I was just um, flipping off my husband because he's eating yeah. pizza right in front of me because he knows I have I to wait. Um, <laughs> but anyways, <Sorry. laughs> but I completely agree. I think you're making a really important point. Um, and I want to, like I said, like reiterate that in the sense that, um, you should always know way more that you're actually including in your book. Um, you need to know your subject so well that you could never possibly cram everything that you know about that into your book. Like you need to have an ocean of knowledge and then you need to include like a couple like 
little like droppers worth, like a lot a yeah. couple drops worth of that knowledge. And like you said, the rest by kind of osmosis, your book will be written with the consistency that mm-hmm. there's more depth, like that you can tell like, oh, there's a current beneath this. There's waves beneath this. There's more to this, but you don't have to explicitly spell that out. Um, in fact, do, do not explicitly spell yeah, that don't, out. Yeah, actually don't do that at all. That's don't the tip. Do that, but, um, <laughs> But you do need to have such a thorough understanding of that. And that means going out of your way beyond just be, first of all, yeah, be a critical thinker. Don't just regurgitate what media Mm -hmm. says or what your pastor says, or even directly what the Bible says, because you really have to do research into context to understand what the Bible says. And so, and then there's a lot of opinions on that. So don't just even do your basic, like, this is what they said. And I agree, like, think obviously about why you agree, but then also like, Go watch documentaries, go read books and read books and watch documentaries that are also from different perspectives on that Mm -hmm. thing. Because at the same, just like we said, like you don't, I think we've said this in a previous episode, you don't ever want to just present one perspective because that's not realistic. And so the book is not going to feel realistic. You walk out the door and there's like a hundred million different perspectives going on around you. Um, Some of them are like kind of similar. Some of them are totally different. So maybe you pick one or two or three and you're like, okay, I'm going to include these all in some sense, you know, because you have, you should have more than one character most likely. And none of them are going to think exactly the same thing. Chris and I are both Christian and both writers, but we have different ideas about things. So a lot of the big stuff we agree on, but that doesn't mean that we agree on absolutely everything. And we're very similar in that sense. Mm -hmm. So and probably not as similar to most other people. So in a book, that needs to be very apparent. And we've said this before too, but it bears repeating. Um, when you include the other perspective, don't, what is it? The straw, don't straw man it. Okay. Yeah. Don't, strong man it. Yeah. You want to make it stronger than you actually think it is so that when you have not an attack, but a critique of it, it actually carries a lot more weight. Yeah, exactly. You need to also understand the opposing perspective like actually understand why people believe it without like judging and being like, well, they're so stupid for believing that. Guess what? It comes across. And if you have a reader who reads your book and feels that way, they're going to feel like you're calling them stupid because you basically are. Um, right. And, and you're that's not, not going to change, their, change mind their mind. And help no. them. Yeah. But if you show that you understand their perspective, you understand where they're coming from and why they logically think the way they do, they're going to be a lot readier to accept that the logic of the message that you're actually trying to make. So that's really important. Um, So also talk to people who think differently than you and do it without judgment. Like, don't just ask, what do you think? Ask, why do you think that? And don't do it with an attitude of like, oh, you're so stupid. Why do you think that way? You know, like really try to understand because everybody has their own system of logic. And it's it's not that it's all so, it's not, I wouldn't say all like the same level of verifiable, but (laughs) there is, everybody feels that they're being logical. There's probably a standard of logic somewhere, but right. You can believe someone is wrong while still respecting their right to be wrong. Essentially. Javi just said that he uh, is the standard of logic. Even he is Uh, not the standard of logic. I know he thinks he is. He's all, (laughs) he really thinks that he's the standard of logic, but you're not. I feel like everyone does. I I think I'm the the standard of logic, but I know I'm not the standard of logic. That's like Mm -hmm. the paradox of logic. Yep. Is that everybody thinks because everybody can see their own logic so clearly that everybody mm-hmm. thinks, well, this is logical. Yeah, and of to course them, everyone it comes is to this conclusion, but like yeah. obviously they don't, or else we wouldn't have disagreements in the world. So yeah, exactly, <laughs> but like so, really understand your subject matter, and then really understand the opposing subject matter, and be willing to present them both with the same level of dignity. If you are not mm-hmm. willing to do that, I think do not pick a message heavy book because it's going to come across. Yeah. And I think too, one of the struggles that I seem to have lately is that it seems that so many books being published today, especially in the trad market, are not doing that. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of books that um, only present one side or present the alternate side, which is often the Christian side, as though they're obviously wrong and they're dumb and they're evil and all this kind of stuff. And that is why I think a lot of books will fall flat. So it's not even you know, only coming from one angle, you have to do that. Whatever angle you're coming from, you have to portray the other side or other sides as yeah. reasonable and as people that are trying to find the right answer, right? You can't just attribute moral intention to people that you're yeah. unwilling to 
you know, hear out or listen to. I think that's a great and point. So, I think all of uh, all of culture could hear that sentence like yeah. about a hundred million times. I wish. You cannot, what, did you say it for me one more time? That was so good. Yeah, nothing. You cannot yeah. attribute moral intention to people you won't hear out. Yes, yeah. you cannot attribute moral no. intention to people you won't hear out. Javi is dancing by like a butterfly. I don't understand. I made a really good point. Man. You did. It's really excited. That was a, a very, very good point. Um, Thank you. But yeah, so um, you guys remember that in everyday life too, but especially yes. in writing. And when mm-hmm. you don't, like she said, even in the trad market, like when you don't do that, it shows you are alienating at least half of your readers, if not more. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also just bad writing. And it's yeah. not going to stand the test of time because guess what? What what people think now morally is not going to be what they think in the future. Like I said, yep. the Bible, I mean, is for the time it came out was extraordinarily radical. It was super, super feminist. Um, and still, I think if you read it in context, I think that it is still. But the way that that the interpretation of that became over time was that you know then like the wives submit to your husbands became very taken out of context you know Mm -hmm. and so it kind of became like anti-feminist over time and that became the new norm so make sure that you are understanding the actual like depth of whatever message you're trying to tell or it's not going to stand the test of time because books that were written um where the where they're all about like how um you know, wives submit to your husband, the husband dominates. They're assuming your that's the only way to see it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They, and they those become books, they're out of date. Out of time. You, you read them and yeah, you're like, that's date. not, yeah. You're like, that's not what we think that anymore. anymore. <laughs> Nobody thinks that. Yeah. And no one ever should have really thought that. It just that at the time was kind of what culture had assumed. And we can't think that we're that much smarter than people who came before us. I'm sure that there are big cultural lies that we have also gotten wrong that we think are right. And we won't know until we learn better. And then it'll be something else. But regardless, you can really avoid your book becoming super out of date and possibly offensive in the future if people decide that it's, you know, offensive by thinking deeply, understanding the issues like at their core, not just mm-hmm. regurgitating stuff. Yeah, not presenting multiple stuff. points of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. multiple Stop points of view. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, so um, kind of back to my trad point, the idea that if other authors are doing it this way, right, if they're not presenting both sides, if they're just coming out of the gate really strong in their own worldview, I think sometimes Christians can look at that and say, okay, well, to combat that, that's what I have to do. I have to say... I'm not going to present the other side. If I do, it's going to be as like purely wrong and purely evil. And I'm not going to mm-hmm. give them, you know, the, the proper, yeah. uh, very anti biblical, by the way, yes, to treat <laughs> so, others as you want to be treated. Yeah. Thank you don't you. treat people the way they're treating you. You treat yeah. them the way you wish they would treat you, the way they're supposed to treat you. You as a yes. Christian still have a moral responsibility to treat other people the way that God tells you to, even if they are not doing you the return favor. Yeah. So if you're writing a book and you say, okay, well, I have to combat all of these, you know, things that I think are bad ideas out there. Therefore, I cannot present those bad ideas. I can't even touch them. I need to pretend they don't exist. I'm just going to present my ideas. And that's mm-hmm. what'll be, you know, the counterattack essentially that won't work because then you're just going to have a world full of people that only read certain books and no yep. one's hearing out the other side at all. So yep. you have to say, okay, It bothers me when other authors do this. It bothers me when only one side is presented. It bothers me when they attribute moral intention to me that I don't have. Therefore, I will not do that to them. I will present a good, um, at least two sides, if not multiple sides, uh, stance on the issue. I will have characters that are good guys and bad guys that kind of agree and disagree with me on various things. I will, you know, write this well. I will have critical thought behind everything that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You still have a responsibility to do that, even if you feel that it's not happening in, uh, other worldviews at the time. Yeah. Cause that, it does kind of bother me when I read a book and I'm like, this person is just clearly very, you know, XYZ worldview. And I can tell not because it's well done, but because that's the only option that's even presented. Exactly. And that's very annoying. And so you want to make sure that you as a Christian are doing better Mm -hmm. than that. You gotta be better than that. Yeah. So I think, I think a big reason that happens is that people are like, well, I don't want to make a good point for the opposite side, especially if I think that it's like morally Mm -hmm. wrong. Like I don't want to accidentally convince someone to think that way. But the thing is, if what you believe is true 
then that's not going to be the case. Maybe you make a good point for the opposition, but you're going to have a better point. And you have to right. believe in that. And if that's not the case, then I, maybe you don't understand your issue. Maybe you're wrong. <laughs> maybe a, may, a, maybe you're wrong. Or B, maybe you don't understand your issue as well you, you think you do. Um, mm-hmm. But it's actually better to make good points for the opposition um, than to make bad points. Because it also raises the bar of the points that you have to make for your side. So it goes from like, oh, yeah, I guess you made a good point about that Christian thing you were talking about, to, Well, that other side had a good point. But wow, the point you made is is even better than that one. So it's kind of like right. irrefutable. Like it actually mm-hmm. really strengthens your argument but in a way that does not detract from the dignity or intelligence of the opposite side. So go for it. Like do your best, whatever, again, I'll quote, I'll quote the Bible again, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Um, yep. So make that good point for your opposition. Like explain well, and, why, why yeah, it's a good and when, thing. When you make a good point for the other side, even if you ultimately feel like you have the better point, you help a yourself and be your readers to understand okay so that's why other people disagree with me yes. and then they have an easier time respecting those people and maybe presenting their arguments like um i took a class in college world religions right and mm-hmm. part of the class was how do you approach a jewish person how do you approach an atheist how do you approach people of different world views when you're going to talk about christianity because mm-hmm. different things will offend those people if you come out of the gate with those things and yeah. different things will appeal to those people so and it's not like manipulation it's just here's how you don't start a conversation with a muslim if you don't want to offend them and hurt their feelings right but you can start a conversation like that with an atheist (laughs) exactly yeah so if you're presenting good points you're essentially saying here is how a rational person could believe something that i think is untrue and then you say but here's how i think the truth actually works and then you kind of counter those ideas against each other and let readers figure it out for themselves because exactly there are a lot of books that i love that do not have Christian worldviews behind them. And what I love about them is they present the option for me to kind of go the other way where I can say, I see what you're doing here. I disagree with your conclusion, but I can still really enjoy it because I feel like you were fair enough that that's still an option you're granting me. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And you can do this. um, This, this just came to mind. You can do this in, um, we haven't talked as much about it because it's just so specific book to book, but like we've said, for the most part, like avoid, you know, actually quoting the Bible and you yeah. know, quoting specific parables and saying like God and Jesus in books because you just you do immediately turn off so many people. And the understanding of all those words contextually is like unique to one tiny specific group of people. So you'll just alienate mm-hmm. people who don't understand those words the same way. Um, but like uh, in the Six of Crows series by Lee Bardugo, and I, this is not me trying to say she's trying to make a statement or all. At, at all because also people are going to read into your book whatever they want and you have to just let that go and just mm-hmm. you know you've you've done your best you've laid out the truth as you see it and the truth as other people see it and you've given your readers the material they need to make an informed decision and I think that that's yep. really our responsibility as Christian writers um, yeah it's not to brainwash it's to make people think things through in a way that you think will get them to the right answer or at least a healthier answer <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just give them what they need to make an informed decision about what the truth actually is. And that can mm-hmm. be really hard when it gets just like kind of touchier stuff like religion. Um, so, I mean, I, but I agree. I think that's the point. You're definitely not trying to brainwash anyone. And that's where a lot of these books also get it wrong. But in Six of Crows, Kaz Brecker is very secular. He is, has no faith, very much the opposite in the sense of morality and beliefs as Inej, another character who prays to the saints who Mm -hmm. uh she i mean she prays all the time she like tries not to kill morally she is like his antithesis and you've got one person who's highly religious and one person who's highly secular and that's not me reading into it that really is the characters Mm -hmm. um and even though she like prays to the saints this is not like a christian religion i don't know what lee bardugo believes and i don't know if she was trying to make a point with this or not but my point is she showed the specific strengths and weaknesses of both sides of that scenario and that can be a great way if you're you know when you're writing a book fantasy or otherwise where you make a point like if your point Mm -hmm. is that people who have some kind of faith typically have more emotional stability to me I felt like that was a point that I could contextually support based on that Mm -hmm. book um you could make that argument um and it's in a much more natural way but you don't read six of crows and go this book is very religious and (laughs) because it's not like a religious book 
but can I like glean a meaning out of an important meaning out of it? Absolutely. I can. Um, Mm -hmm. so whether she intended that or not, and you can include more of that with intention, um, in your book than not. Cause I think you can, you can also read into stuff more as a reader, but you can include more opportunities for that kind of, for noticing that kind of thing. Um, but that it really is as simple and as complicated as that. Yeah. I mean, really comparing and contrasting different character personality traits or worldviews is a great way to do that. Um, especially if they are in like that found family kind of scenario where Mm -hmm. they have mutual respect for each other. So any kind of discussion or even argument they have about it is going to play out very differently than two enemies. Yes. And so I I do think it's done well in that context for sure. I agree. This might be controversial. I don't know, but if you are a Christian and a writer and you're not writing in the Christian market, I think maybe, you know, when you've succeeded, when people read your book and have to ask themselves, is this person religious? Not when they know for sure one way or the other. Yep. Uh, I think that's when you've done your job well, uh, because you, I'm obviously as a Christian, you want to like speak the truth and spread the gospel and all of that kind of stuff. But Mm -hmm. when you're writing, you want to, like I said, you want to make people think. And if you're making people think Maybe the conclusions shouldn't be as um, obvious right off the bat as it would be if you're like actually talking to a real person and giving like an actual account of the gospel, right? Yeah. So I think maybe you've succeeded when you are like Lee Bardugo, or I feel like, um, is it Christelle Dabos who wrote the Mirror Visitor series or Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman? If you guys mm-hmm. have read the Illuminate series or the Aurora Cycle series, like, I'm not sure. I, they could be religious. They certainly have some interesting points about religion mm-hmm. and the way that they write about sci-fi things, yeah. but I don't know for sure because it's not preachy and there are multiple angles being given on everything going on. And I think that's when you've succeeded, when people can say, hmm, is this person religious? Is this author religious? Is this character someone that I admire, someone I would want to be like? What are the pitfalls? What are the benefits? Um, when you get them thinking those things through, I think that's when you've uh, succeeded so you don't necessarily have to be you you can be open about it but you don't need to be uh like annoyingly blatant about it yeah. is maybe the point it's true well you have to think about um like you want to honor and respect why your readers picked up your book if they wanted to mm-hmm. listen to a sermon they would go they would to church or to open a podcast yeah they would yeah. go listen to a sermon if they wanted to read a book about christianity they would get a book about christianity if mm-hmm. they want an awesome story about dragons and wizards and whatever, and that's on your book cover, then that's what they want. And you need mm-hmm. to respect that and don't trick them because then you've right. also burned a reader and every other potential reader that that reader talks to. Um, that is a great so. point. Do not trick readers. Do not. <laughs> that's actually readers. an excellent point. Do not pretend like your book is totally secular and it's gonna have all these things that are just like so normal these days and then like bam god is there in the middle out of nowhere don't like don't do that if you're like it's really obviously a christian book i feel like the craft is good but i just can't hide that it's really obviously christian find a christian publisher and and or make it very clear in your marketing and even the way you write the book jacket that it's coming from a religious perspective tell people Mm -hmm. what they're in for up front if you're like it's just gonna be really obvious it just is that's okay. Like I said, that sci-fi series for middle graders, I mean, that that one was very obvious. I mean, as an adult reading it, very obvious. Yeah. As a middle schooler, it wasn't that obvious. <laughs> Maybe to me. not. Yeah. Um, but marketing wise, it was obvious enough that like they did a good job. They they went with Moody Publishing. They were made it clear that it came from a religious perspective. So nobody was tricked and it was awesome. And yeah. I think that that's very key. Um, what else was I going to say? I'm sorry I interrupted you. That no, was just no, you're good. <laughs> no, you're totally don't right. Trick people. Um, don't trick people. Yeah. I mean, that's what's so unsatisfying. You just, you burn so many readers. And that we've talked about that in other genres and stuff too. Like don't imply yeah. there's something in your book or isn't something in their book when that's not the case. Um, yeah. It don't say there's a trope readers. that's there that isn't there. Don't say yeah, there's a quote there that. that's not there. Don't do that kind of stuff. It's no, annoying. it's annoying. Yeah. Um, I think it was Zachary Levi. If not, it's an actor that reminds me of Zachary Levi said okay. once that, um, he is not a Christian actor. He's an actor who's Christian. And yeah. I think that that, I mean, that has just stuck with me for years. Um, do you want to hear my kind of nerdy take on am. that? Yes, I do. Okay. So if you're calling yourself a Christian blank, that's actually not a good thing to do as a Christian because the noun is always the most important part 
of a phrase. So Mm -hmm. you need to be essentially like an actor and a Christian or a writer and a Christian. You can't be a Christian yes. actor because then Christian is actually not as important as actor. Actor becomes the most important part of that phrase. So if, if you have an, an adjective will obviously change the meaning of a noun, but the noun is still the noun. It's still the most important part. So really you should yeah. be an acting Christian and or a writer Christian or, or a writing Christian, right? Yeah. So Ooh. The, the most important piece should be the Christian aspect. So anyway, I like that's, that. That's my I grammar like your nerdy input take. for the episode. That was, yeah. that's excellent. That's so even from like another perspective. Now I like that saying even more. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I just, I had liked it originally because it puts the craft first and foremost, which yes. is what your readers are coming to you for. It's yeah. they're coming to you for a good story typically, unless and, you are going through a Christian publisher and you're really obviously yeah. marketing to Christians, but that's pretty rare. Um, I would say Do most you Christian want... writers I know don't to appeal only to Christians or do you want to appeal to everyone and that's a decision you have to make and it's fine if you want to write for Christians there is obviously a market for that but if you want to appeal to everyone you don't have to sequester yourself away in a box where you end up tricking people or only communicating with like a fraction of the population (laughs) you want to you can you don't have to hide it you just have to do it well you don't have to yeah. hide that you're a Christian. You just need to embed it in the book in, in such a way that people are listening to you and you're not talking down to them and you're not preaching at them. Yep. And now I'm on a soapbox. So I'm going to stop. But yeah. <laughs> well, this is a podcast where we talk about sorry. all of the best and worst of writing. So I feel like we get a little yeah. soapboxy every episode. Yeah. Um, but this one, I mean, it's true. It's also true. Like just to once one more time for if you guys have stuck around and you're not a, and you're not Christian and you're just like, I just really liked, you know, write about like moral or political or philosophical, you know, whatever. Um, it just applies to everybody. All of the same rules. Make sure that you understand your, uh, the opposing perspectives more than one, present them in a fair light. Like you would want them to be presented because it only strengthens your argument. And this was the last point that I wanted to make about, um, switching back specifically for our our writers who are Christian, um, which is that I think sometimes we're afraid if we don't hit the point hard enough, then we're not doing it justice as Christians. And we, we need to do a better job by doing it more. And I think that it's really the opposite. Um, and we have to mm-hmm. remember, you know, God doesn't yeah. need us to do anything. Okay. Right. Like he created the world. He doesn't need us like little peons, you know, although yeah. he doesn't see us that way, but I he mean, could come do on. Without us, he could do it without he us. Not to. Yeah. yeah. And so I think what you do is be diligent with what you've been given. That means information and access to information, maybe talent, maybe the ability to hone your craft, um, present the best argument you can for all perspectives, even the ones that you don't agree with, even the ones that you think are anti-Christian still do a good job. Like mm-hmm. with dignity. God can handle that. He is yeah, aware God that those things that. exist. That's the thing. God's not like, oh no, I didn't think about that. Shh, you oh can't no, tell what them. a good point this atheist oh, made. No, like, exactly. He's- He's That's totally not the, fine. <laughs> exactly. And I, so I think out of fear sometimes for accidentally making a point for the wrong, for what we consider the wrong side, you know, like you're like, oh no, I don't mm-hmm. want to like draw some over to the wrong side or because we're like, oh, I want to do this justice. I feel like I'm, you know, morally in the wrong if I don't, you know, state basically that this is the moral right. Mm-hmm. You guys just can let all of that fear, all of that worry go because if yeah. you're a Christian, you have faith or should have faith. Yeah. And um, part of that is that you do your best and you give God the rest. And that yeah. is across the It's not the your board. job to seal the not deal. Not your job. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> Sealing the deal, not up to you. So mm-hmm. have faith, do your best, leave the rest. That is how that's, I mean, I think largely what faith in the Bible is like, I think that that's the application of it for the most part. Um, so just have faith that if you've done your best job and your best at, at saying your point and your best at communicating the opposing points that God will do with that, what he wants to do with that. And his plans mm-hmm. are better than ours anyways. He tends to be a lot more reliable in that sense. So I know mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm alienating a little bit, um, being more specifically <laughs> Christian in this, but if you are Christian, you're not then, wrong. <laughs> then this is based in your belief system. So if that is yeah. what's been holding you back from writing, um, stories that could be so much more impactful and so much more moving or just like such better stories craft wise let that go you don't need to worry about that it's just it's not going to be a problem it's just simply not Mm -hmm. um and now I'll open things back up to our (laughs) non-christian writers who have stuck with us hey you can come back (laughs) you guys are I mean now you were obviously we're welcome to listen to that part but I know it's not the same if you're you know not on the inside of it you might not have the same Mm -hmm. 
belief system. But if you do have that belief system, that's pretty core to it. I think pretty much everyone in that belief system agrees. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So did, were those all your tips? I have a couple extra ones, but they're kind of off category. Go for it. Okay, great. So I have a tip uh, that's more about like your mental state as a Christian writing. So, or a couple about this. So first of all, I think you need to know in advance what you are trying to do if you're going to be a writer, right? So I think it's very likely, again, if you believe in Christianity, that the world is going to try to uh, skew you, right? They're going to try to bring you over to their side. They're going to like little by little try to chip away at your faith and your belief until you are more like them, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to have a good sense up front of what it is a, what you believe, but also B, what your goal is as a writer. So like my goal as a writer, obviously I've kind of touched on this, is that I want Christians and non-Christians alike to have to think through things on a deeper level than churches and other people outside of churches tend to like ask you to think yeah. uh, things through on. I think people need to think things through better and deeper. And since I'm a YA author, I think you need to start doing it as a teenager because that's when you're most likely to be led astray. So yeah. that's my goal. And if there are certain there are certain things I would compromise on and there are certain things I would not. So I think you need to have those that list of things that you're willing to compromise on and the things you're not set in stone before you really try for any degree of success if you're going indie or if you're going trad. Obviously, the querying process is really hard and it can be really tempting to uh, say like, okay, I'm just going to forego this thing that I believe and I'm going to write a book. To like, It can be really tempting to write a really spicy book and we can talk about this in a minute, but should you be doing that? Is that something you actually want to do or is that you panicking because you're afraid you can't make it unless you make these compromises that you otherwise wouldn't make. Yeah. So that goes for a lot of things that goes for popular tropes too. And also I think people are like wedging like BIPOC characters and like Mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus characters in. And if you're just wedging them in because you feel pressure to, because that's what socially is in demand right now, it's It's probably hurting your writing more than it's helping Mm -hmm. it. Typically anything that you have to shoehorn in wasn't supposed to be in the story to begin with. Um, Mm -hmm. And it ends up also typically being feeling very inauthentic and actually kind of offensive to the people that it's designed to be good for. (laughs) Yeah. Nobody wins in that scenario. Um, But this is the same concept. Um, I do think that um, Christians, because, and probably, probably Christians and also other religious people, because we tend to have a more set 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 of um, like moral rules that we, a more rigid set, a more rigid set of rules regarding morality that we try to follow. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that it's that you come across the situation probably more if you are a Christian or religious writer and you're like, I feel pressured because of what the demand is because of the demand that's out there to write something that maybe goes against my, um, belief system. And Mm -hmm. you shouldn't feel that way. We've all felt it, but don't give in. Stay strong. Don't, don't feel, nobody feel pressured to write something you don't want to write. (laughs) Exactly. It's art. It's yours. It's, it's, yeah. People should not be making those kinds of demands on you. And even if they do, you should be able to stand strong in what it is you want to do. Because otherwise, I I think it can be tempting as a Christian in really any industry, but you know, again, for our purposes in writing to say, okay, well, if I just give in here, then people will be listening to me long enough to hear my ultimate point, right? I'll get them Mm -hmm. all the way to the end and then they'll hear me out, but they probably won't because you've probably undermined that point to get to the end. And so you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you end up doing that. I know I'm being really vague, but think about the things that that you really care about as a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, Like the things you're not willing to compromise on, don't compromise on them in your books. And again, we'll get to this. You can discuss things that you disagree with Mm -hmm. without falling into the trap of like committing that sin or, you know, however you want to describe it. But um, there is a line between presenting a point and compromising on what you actually think the truth is. Absolutely. There is no in advance what it is you're trying to do. If it helps make a list, if not, then just have some standards in mind that you will not flounder on. Um, And then my other point that I want to make is that I've been noticing this a lot lately, which I kind of touched on, (laughs) that it can be, um, when you're writing, it can sometimes be easier to fall into certain sins 
because it's easy to say, oh, it's just a book. I'm not actually yeah. doing this thing. Um, I think this is true of sex. I think this is true of violence. I think this is true mm-hmm. of cursing and um, dishonoring parents and all gossip and all the other things mm-hmm. that are not right in Christianity, right? Yeah. And um, not that, I mean, sex is fine, but it has to be in a certain place. I don't mean to say that it's wrong all the time, but <laughs> <She's> <laughs> there's like there's morals around it. Sex. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? No. Um, everything else mostly, yeah. But um, you... <laughs> It can be easy sometimes to just say, and this is something I've been struggling with lately is where is the line, right? Where do I start to fall into that sin in order to portray that it is just a reality of the world, right? So this is kind of leading into my next point, which is how do you feel about Christians having like cursing or sex scenes or excessive violence in books? Because I think that's up for heavy debate uh, with a lot of Christians. It is. What do you think? And I think, well, I think it is up for heavy debate because, well, as far as like the, the personal implications for the author, it's hard because, um, sex, cursing, and violence are all areas that every Christian seems to have a, not a different belief about necessarily, but like they fall somewhere on a spectrum of belief about it. You Mm -hmm. know, like most, Mm -hmm. most people, most practicing Christians would probably say, yeah, it's better to wait until marriage or till you're like committed in, you're like in a basically marriage, um, to Mm -hmm. have sex. And most of them will fall somewhere on that spectrum. They might be a little more loose on that or a little more rigid on that. Same with cursing. They're probably like, Hey, either, you know, no cursing at all, or like, Hey, language, like they'll take it. Cause this is, cause the, you, you and I fall a little bit different on the spectrum of cursing mm-hmm. because you're more like right. no cursing. And I'm mm-hmm. usually more like, I think it's about the intention of the words. Mm-hmm. And I think that both of those interpretations can be supported contextually in the Bible. Um, right. I think the the sex one is a little a little harder to I I think yeah well, this the is sex one opinion, is more like though. people not paying attention to the Bible as opposed to having a legitimate different opinion but it feels we'll more like there. that yeah but again if you guys can contextually support um you know your interpretation of it um and some people can they feel that they can and that's mm-hmm. fine um so it's hard and same with violence um it falls on a spectrum. And Mm -hmm. so it's hard because what one writer who's a Christian might write and feel is acceptable. Another one might not. So I think that cursing, um, I think any language that's like intended to hurt people, um, or cut people down, I think that it should only be used in the context of intending to hurt someone or cut someone down. People do Mm -hmm. use language that way in the world. And because art should reflect life, it's okay to do that. But I would say as a writer who's Christian, I don't want to fall into the trap of using cursing or mean language, like in a, in a way that like, uh, puts it on a pedestal that makes it like, oh, this yeah. is okay. This is actually good to do, you know, like right. if that's happening in the book, I want it to be bad, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's for, that's for words that I find like actually like offensive and cursing, like some words like damn and hell. I don't, to me, they're just, yeah. those are like really, low level like, curse words. <laughs> they're low level curse words and they're usually not used to like, <laughs> you know, offend like, in the hurt same way. someone. Yeah, yeah. They're usually like more like expletives. So I think expletives are kind of an exception, but that's my personal belief. Um, but I'm mm-hmm. pretty consistent on that too. So you won't see that yeah. waiver from book to book with me. Um, but for me, the, I don't want to idolize using, um, cursing or cruel language to hurt people. I don't want to idolize that. And just like, right. you know, like p- people do have sex before marriage and yep. sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a lot sometimes it's like ca- very casual sometimes it's just like with one person who they're committed to and regardless of you know like what your feelings are on it if you are a christian writer you need to or a writer who's christian know what you believe about that subject and just decide that you're not going well you can include anything on that spectrum because the whole spectrum exists in real life so mm-hmm. any of that can be included in your story i think you just have to make the goal for yourself that i'm not going to idolize that i'm not going to put that on a pedestal and say this is a good thing i'm going to make mm-hmm. sure that my writing presents the real you know pros and cons of that and it's right. something where somewhere again where you're like pros and cons but but yeah. I, I, as a Christian, like, there I don't no want to show that there are no, pro- <laughs> there are no pros to having sex before yeah. marriage. Okay. But that's not realistic. You have to trust mm-hmm. that if you present, Otherwise the people actual, do it. exactly. So no. present the actual <laughs> pros and the actual cons and trust that, yeah. um, the truth will come out because guess what? If truth is not, it's not movable. 
nothing that you can do or say is you can't actually undermine it (laughs) you can't undermine it so don't worry about it um but I just think know know where you stand on those subjects um specifically on the spectrum and then just decide that you are you are going to do everything in your power to not make it seem like you're praising the thing you know like present it realistically don't praise it um, same with yeah. violence. Have realistic like, so- consequences. Yeah, exactly. Realistic consequences. Violence. Um, I mean, gratuitous violence is so normal in entertainment and media. I don't like gratuitous violence. That's kind of where I fall on that. However, some things in life are very violent. The Old Testament is extraordinarily violent. That's true. Do I think that you always <laughs> need to be really graphic about it? No. Can there sometimes be reasons to be graphic as a storyteller? Absolutely. Um, so decide what you feel about that and just don't be like gratuitous violence is awesome. You know, like I think probably most (laughs) Christians would agree with that as well. So if you have gratuitous violence, be clear that it's gratuitous violence. Um, Mm -hmm. and, or if you have violence of any kind, like, just don't be like, and violence rocks, you know? Like, this is great. <laughs> we'd be like, wow, violence often involves a lot of suffering emotionally and physically, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, however, is there sometimes a cause for it? I would say, yeah, but right. there could be people who disagree with me. The Quakers probably wouldn't agree with me on that. Um, True. <laughs> so, and that's also a generalization because every person who is a part of the Quaker religion is an individual who might have their belief might fall on their own spectrum. So mm-hmm. It's very personal. It's very specific. I think my answer kind of just comes back to what you said, which is know what you're trying to say. So especially about those three things, if you're, if you are specifically, Mm -hmm. and again, this is probably more for the writers who are Christian um, and, and, or religious, because I think a lot of religions tend to take the same stances on these things. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, be consistent. Those are obviously not like the biggest, like the only like rules that Christians follow, you know, there's the 10 whole Mm -hmm. 10 commandments and stuff. Um, Right. I mean, if if you need just like a baseline rule book to follow, if that's, I guess you can (laughs) just use that. (laughs) Yeah. 10 simple rules. Um, But just know what you believe, know what you don't want to say or, and like, that's it. Just, just know what you don't want to say. Doesn't mean you can't Mm -hmm. include it. Just make sure that you're not praising something that you don't agree with because, media does or because that's what people expect or just because you weren't thinking that hard about it when you wrote it Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna see taunting you again my husband is being very explicit it's very inappropriate ah javi go away go away Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh so yeah i i would have one more thing to add to that which is i think um as a christian you have to know where your own weaknesses are so we've kind of touched an awful lot on the idea of critically thinking through things. So Mm -hmm. if you just don't know how you feel about an issue, I don't think there's anything wrong with writing to try to figure it out. I do that a lot, but ultimately when it comes down to publishing it, if you just feel like you don't have a good grasp on what, you know, the biblical stance is on that or what you're trying to say, don't try to don't like take, um, don't try to become an expert in something you don't actually know a lot about. Don't draw a hard Um, line. Yeah. And also you're not fully confident in. Right. And also you need to know where your own personal weaknesses are. So if you don't have any kind of, you know, personal issue with falling into violence, maybe you can write scenes that are a little more graphic, right? Or sex scenes that are a little more graphic or more mm-hmm. cursing or whatever. Yeah. But if you find that as you're writing that your mindset starts to change or you kind of fall into those habits in your real life, I would argue that maybe you should stay away from those because obviously you don't want to be committing sins uh, that you can otherwise avoid. So I think for every person, that's going to be a little different of a line too. So like mm-hmm. you're saying, it's just going to depend on where your personal stance is on that, but also where your personal struggle is with those things. So yeah, if you feel like you have a really solid handle on something, maybe you can go a little farther than other people. And so maybe, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't, you have to I don't know, pray about that or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) But um, you don't let yourself fall into sins just because it's easy to, you know, justify it with the fact that you're not actually doing them to real people. Because the problem is that the more you do things to fictional people, the more you will start doing them to real people. So it's true. I guess just make sure your mindset remains solid. Yeah. On those types of things. I think that's, I agree. I think that's why knowing, um, knowing what you don't want to put on a pedestal in your writing, Mm -hmm. I think will 
make a big difference. Because I think as long as you're writing with the intention that, okay, I'm going to include this because this is real life and we should absolutely be able to write about any aspect of real life. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm going to include it realistically and I'm going to make sure that I don't accidentally glorify something that shouldn't be glorified. Um, And if you know what that is in advance, then I think that you're good. I think that you're probably safeguarding uh, yourself and your heart. But yeah, if you're just kind of, you know, falling into these tropes or these um, commonalities in writing and they go against your moral beliefs and you're not, you haven't decided specifically not to glorify that, um, then yeah, you might be at more risk of accidentally falling into that as a habit. So Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's about going into it with intention. It kind of goes back to that verse. I don't remember where it is in the Bible, but um, do everything you do for the glory of the one who made you. Right. Uh So if you're writing, you don't want to let the process of creating art lead you into a sin because that's not glorifying to God. And you also don't want the ultimate result to be glorifying something that is counter to him. So and like you always say, the people are going to get what they're going to get out of your books. They might get something out of it that you didn't want them to. But that's was not that your responsibility yeah it, it's it's on them basically you're just kind of presenting the story as is so are you glorifying that thing are you trying to say that thing is good or is it coming from the reader so yeah that's where i put that um i have one more tip go for it uh <laughs> okay cool <laughs> so i feel like this is running long but i can't tell um okay. i think Another issue that I've struggled with just personally is that if you're a writer, and I think if you're an artist in general, but again, for our purposes, if you're a writer, (laughs) um, I think it can be easy to fall into the sin of idolatry for your own art, right? So idolatry is obviously a really big, really problematic sin in the Bible. It's it's basically the sin that leads to all others Mm -hmm. um, because it's basically just pride. that it's you don't want to get in the place of God. Just so yes. if anyone is, um, if you're, to if you've stuck around yeah. and you're not, and you're not, um, yeah, Christian or not from a Christian background, idolatry in the Christian religion typically refers to putting anything in the place of God. So behaving yes. worshipfully, you know, worshiping mm-hmm. basically anything other than God. And you can, and, uh, it's, it's real easy to do. <laughs> yeah. You can end up worshiping yourself. You can end up worshiping a celebrity. You can end up worshiping something good, like money, your family or your spouse. Yeah. yeah all things kinds of that things are that are otherwise good. Those are the things um, that's easiest to do. Christians yeah, and you don't notice worship it. themselves so so much, much. Don't it do is, that. it's rough it's so hard yeah. it's really it's, hard because you slip into it it's hobbies yeah. that's people who get really really into their hobbies um mm-hmm. that can happen so so I do think that if you are a writer you have to be on guard against idolizing your own writing because mm-hmm. I just from personal experience that's a that's a potential pitfall and um I I guess you just have to make sure that you're still making time for God over all things, right? Mm-hmm. So it don't if you if you're not like reading the Bible every day, don't forego your Bible time to write. Mm-hmm. Uh, you yeah. should still put that first if you only have time to do one and those types yeah. of things. So, um, I mean, I'm not saying every day. I guess you could have a couple of days there where you need to get something done, but yeah. The whatever point is your you don't want to fall into that the thing. idea is to not yeah. sacrifice your time with god for whatever you need to get done or or whatever you think you need to get done and specifically doing because of the podcast that we're in right now but specifically writing mm-hmm. um don't sacrifice the time that you had planned to spend with god uh for your writing because yeah. again like spend your time with god be diligent and guess what God will give you the time he will make the time for you if that's what he wants you to do and you don't have to worry about it do your best leave the rest so do your best first and foremost to you know follow your beliefs Um, and by your beliefs I do mean I personally am talking about you know God's truth and that means constantly learning and evolving um, Mm -hmm. and unlearning things that you learned incorrectly because that unfortunately is very very common Um, Mm -hmm. not just in religions just across the board that's what humans do uh, yeah. We have to learn and unlearn stuff all the time, but just do your best at that. Um, and if, I guess if you're not a Christian, then I, you could, you could equate it to do your best at being a good moral person. Um, mm-hmm. And the rest will probably fall into place more, but specifically if you're a Christian, you know, commit to God, do your best for God and where, um, you know, if all things of then the spiritual realm are, you know, all of that stuff, like dedicate yourself to that. Um, and God will make way for other things in your life that are important. 
includes yeah. storytelling. And I also, I, I don't think that God plants desires in our hearts that we're not meant to do anything with. So if you're like, oh, but what if God doesn't want me to be a writer? Do you want to tell stories? Do yeah. you still want to tell stories? Mm-hmm. Then God made you it's that It's probably way. in the plan somewhere. It's probably <laughs> in the plan. So just, you know, trust that someone's got the plan going and, and just yeah. don't just worry a whole lot less, honestly. Yeah. And you're probably more likely to ruin it by following following falling into idolatry than like keeping the course in a way that seems counterproductive yeah so absolutely just again personal pitfall I've been dealing with for a while so just don't idolize yourself or your writing because yeah that's not the point you're only doing it anyway for God so yeah don't let don't let that fall away and uh, don't forget that that's really the ultimate goal here I agree My biggest pitfall as a writer who's Christian is probably the wanting to um, control the outcome of people's thoughts. Because, of course, I'm like, I know what I believe and here's why I believe it. Um, So while I don't think I think I'm pretty intentional about not only presenting one perspective in my book, I'm always trying to do a better job at at presenting other perspectives, but really more on just like my heart level. Like I need to not worry about it so much because I really Mm -hmm. do spend a lot of time worrying about it. and I think the worry actually distracts me from doing mm-hmm. my best at presenting you know my perspective and the other perspectives that I want to do diligence to so for me personally right. that's probably my biggest pitfall as a writer who's yeah. Christian um everyone's got at least one if not more. say what is yours think about yeah. it know what it is yeah. what's Don't yours know what it. it is yeah <laughs> absolutely um, and if you guys are not Christian, but you have stuck around because you feel that you have something important to say and you want to say it most effectively, thank you for sticking around. Hopefully this yeah, was thanks. helpful and not um, not super uh, grating <laughs> for you yeah, guys. Hopefully. Yeah, because we want to hear what you have to say too. So mm-hmm. everybody deserves to be heard. It feels like yeah. Disney Channel when I say that, but it is true. You got to weigh things. You have to... If you're only presented one option, then how can you be sure that that option is true? But if you can explore a bunch of them and then you still end up in that place, you can be confident in it. So Yeah, honestly, we just need people to be honest. We need writers of all kinds and all belief systems to be honest about what they believe and why, to present their perspective, to present their takes on other people's perspectives so that readers have all of this information and they can make an informed decision. I think largely... A lot of the problems with um, the way the world is right now is because um, starting as young as like, you know, elementary schoolers, but especially like you were saying, young adults are just, um, and even adults are just not given the information or a fair and equal level of quality of information across the board to make an informed decision. And they're not taught how to make an informed decision. So while we can't exactly teach people how to make decisions, that's something that I really wish we still had logics for in school. Um, we can at least provide the information and also a great story, which mm-hmm. means just escape For and anyone. wonderful entertainment. However, yes. Yeah. How deep you want to go, the story exactly. will work. Exactly. Yeah. And you preside them and you provide them with some valuable information so they can make an informed decision, which is always better. I mean, I would rather have somebody make what they feel is an informed decision for not the truth than make an uninformed decision for what like I consider the truth to be because one of those is going to last and one of them isn't um Mm -hmm. I mean in that scenario I guess if it was something I didn't agree with I would just assume that that one wouldn't last if they make an informed decision because you can make an informed decision and then later make another informed decision and change your mind yeah you know I used to believe a lot of things that I look back on and I'm like I see why I believe that but wow was that that wrong (laughs) exactly I do it all the time so um yeah I guess that's kind of my final thoughts on the matter yeah hopefully that all made sense to you guys yeah i I think it did. <laughs> you guys are like, wow, these people are insufferable. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's okay. I'm, I'm not sorry. I've been very clear about this part of my personality. Um, anyways, do you want to tell me about your writing? I don't really have any updates because I've been reading. So we'll swap here. I took over book <gasps> recommendations. So Perfect. you take over writing I'll updates. I'll take over writing updates. Okay. So last yeah. time I told you guys, that I was going to decide which book I'm going to finish writing by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did. And not only did I decide on which book I'm going to finish writing by the end of the year, I also outlined it. So that was exciting. I did like tons of prep work, tons of outlining. And I will say I did pick the, um, I don't know that it's a retelling or if it's more of an inspired by, but it is kind of a Cinderella spinoff, kind of. Nice. Very different. 
Um, I think it's going to be, I'm still having a really hard time with the setting because I'm like, I don't, I don't know that I want to do fantasy. Um, I don't know. I don't want to do sci-fi. It's kind of like a post post apocalyptic kind of society. Um, if you read okay. a thousand heartbeats by Kira Cass, I don't know what you would call that setting. It's not a dystopia. It's almost, it's like a fantasy world. Like there's like castles and stuff. Is it but like it's, a dystopia that fell? So it's like after yeah, it's a like dystopia? A, it's after a dystopia. So like the, okay. there's, so it's more like a fantasy world, but it's after a yeah. dystopia. And so I don't really know how to describe that setting, but in my head, that's what it is. So we'll see if it, if the setting stays that way. I'm I'm still toying around with the setting, but cool. um, I'm psyched that I finally have an update for you guys. I'm yeah. so pleased. See, I told you guys I was going to do it and I'm going to do it. Now, what goal can I set yeah. for myself to do in the next two weeks? Um, I First will. Chapter. I don't know. Yes. That's a yeah. good idea. Um, I will say that I will have finished outlining and background work and i will have at least at least uh two pages okay because i still have cool. uh, still have a bit more in the, like the prep the prep phase before mm-hmm. i feel like i'm really ready for a full chapter but yeah. that is my goal and maybe i'll exceed it i exceeded my, the goal that i set for myself these last two weeks so um right. everyone's like yeah it was a really easy goal <laughs> it was really hard <laughs> what i wanted yeah, it, to write starting about starting is the hardest part so it is the hardest part. Um, but yeah. I started to like get into it and get excited. And I did pick this because I actually um love some of the themes, some of like the moral themes of Cinderella and always yeah. have. So mm-hmm. I'm excited because it also means like there's like a built-in theme that I love that I've been yeah. wanting the chance to work with in my books. It just hasn't really come up. So I'm super excited. So I get to like play with that theme some. But I also get to like, cool. I think I'm gonna try and make it like a more inspired by than based on so there'll be like elements of cinderella you'll be able to tell you know but it's not Mm going to be like a retelling of cinderella Uh, i feel like there's a lot of those um and everyone's doing retellings now and i don't know if i I just was like i want to be a part of the trend because kendall did one and you did one and i'm like i don't know if i'm just like feeling the peer pressure but i don't think it is because typically when more than one person goes one way i have to go the other way that's um, true i was gonna say you're a rebel <laughs> so that can't be it <laughs> I, I really don't think that's it and and it it does kill me right now that i feel like every movie is a remake it yeah. kills me and it's a, mm-hmm. it's it's killing me that, I, that i'm working on a book that some people are gonna be like it's just a remake and i'm gonna be it just is killing me that i'm accidentally on trend um, I hate that. <laughs> I hate it so much. It'll um, probably go well for you in querying. So, hopefully. you know, you hate it at this end, but you might love unless, it at the back end. Unless the trend is over by the time I finish the book, because I feel like that always happens to me. So fingers mm-hmm. crossed that I finish the book and it's ready to query before this trend of remakes and retellings and inspired by is over. Even though I don't love that this this trend, I do happen to have an idea for it, which did come to me in a dream. As actually, uh, I think... The I best. think all the books that I've finished writing have started as dreams. So maybe that's a, a cool. good sign, hopefully, knock on wood. But anyways, yes. that's my writing update. I'm very proud of Yay. myself. Exciting. That's awesome. Yay. Yeah. Woo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Progress. Yes, thank goodness. Progress. I am thinking to possibly give the character an animal sidekick, but I don't know how I feel about it. Not like a talking sometimes... animal. No. Absolutely <laughs> not. I hate talking animals. How could you even? Yeah. say it oh my god if you guys Did I tell you it, in the book I wrote <laughs> yeah Ash hates talking animals I, I talking animals. in the book I wrote the beginning of the year I did include um like someone who shapeshifts into an animal and it's like one of the other characters like greatest fear to like be around a talking animal and I was like I'm just gonna channel Ash for <laughs> this scene it was so fun <laughs> yep yeah. I hate talking animals you guys anyway. I'm not trying to be a buzzkill but I do I was just organizing our like kids movies because like I was organizing the DVDs and like there's like just a bunch of talking animals and all these kids movies and I'm like ugh, disgusting mm-hmm. I hate it so much yeah how do you get a- around that I guess Rapunzel tangled right um mm-hmm. the sidekicks don't talk so yeah, that's a good one kicks don't talk yeah so I gotta find I mean I, there's a lot of the Disney princess movies where like the animal sidekick doesn't necessarily talk um but they're still right. so like human-ish I'm like oh, I, that's still too sure. much so I'm I'm struggling to figure out if I'm going to be able to include like an animal sidekick in a way that is I feel realistic 
you know, because for me, I'm like, yeah, is an animal sidekick realistic? And if so, in what scenario would it be realistic? And what kind of animal? Because I will give you guys a little bit of insight into the setting that I'm toying with, which is kind of like a, like I said, like post post apocalyptic, like kind of like feudal um, prairie land, like feudal, like okay. fron- frontier prairie type land, but there's also castles. So, mm-hmm. or maybe there'll be like really big plantation type homes. I don't know. Like I'm still mm-hmm. really trying to pin down some things, but the first part of the setting that I described, that's st- I think is like what it's going to be. But now I'm trying to figure out like what fantasy elements can I include that won't feel really out of place? Because in my head, there's a castle because in my dream, there was a castle, but dreams are very disjointed so I don't know if it it's actually true. fits <laughs> so I have to figure that out um that's what I'm working on but that's kind of a little bit of insight so I'm trying to think like okay what animals would exist in this region and I'm like well, I don't really want her to have like a pet scorpion because scorpions are disgusting and also I don't believe it's that true. they would form an emotional attachment and I'm like okay yeah. snakes okay, there's also some snakes that are really like very like you make you think of like life on the prairie and I'm like I like I don't think that's I don't want I don't want that vibe you know like yeah. this, having a snake for a pet is a very specific vibe and I don't think that my main character has it so I'm like what can I do maybe there'll be like a bird that like kind of flies in and out the window sometimes yeah I want to do the mockingbird because it's the Texas state bird but then everyone's gonna be like oh it's like the mockingjay which from yeah. from uh hungry right. so that's annoying so and i can't do a road runner because they don't fly they run so and i they can't do. do an armadillo because it'd be like why is there an armadillo running around the castle i have been it's the tiny details that are not that important but i want i don't them know set an armadillo so an armadillo running around a castle would be hilarious wouldn't it be so funny so- but I'm yeah. like, I don't want to cross the line into the role doll. I don't want to be nonsensical, uh, you know? So yeah. I don't know what I can get away with. Um, so do that a lizard, is also... maybe. I could do it's a different lizard. different than a snake. But... I could do a lizard. There's, yeah. I could do like a horny Not toad. Possibly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got to think about it. But so these are the setting, the specifics of like the setting, like the architecture mm-hmm. and history specifically, and then the animal sidekick. <laughs> these yeah. are the stupid things that are currently have me stumped so hopefully i will have those two things resolved and i will have at least two pages written um in the next two weeks which i know so you guys are like that's nothing you don't know how hard i've been thinking about this freaking animal sidekick okay you gotta get it right you can't change it after get it right exactly and the setting i'm like everything i want this like the setting of this book to be like so immersive i can't get it wrong i have to really yeah. have a very clear idea of it so i'm working on that and um it is it's not going to be like a full epistolary but it is going to be largely told through um like diary entries and letters so i'm excited cool. about that too because i don't usually get to nice. do that which i also think kind of shakes up the cinderella angle and makes it a little more original so mm-hmm. don't take awesome. my ideas guys they're like we don't want <laughs> your post post dystopian armadillo idea okay <laughs> We don't want to write about armadillos running around a castle. But well, why? You know what? I'm gonna have fun. I want I that in my life out. now. Right? <laughs> I'm like, that sounds adorable, but how can I really yes. sell it? <laughs> oh, if I can. <laughs> you gotta just commit. You gotta be like, this is just the way go it is. For it. This is the way it is. Yeah. Armadillos live in castles here, okay? So <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, I hopefully I'll have answers for you guys next week. Tune tune in for more <laughs> of Ash's nonsense, some Ash yeah. brand nonsense next week. Yeah. Uh, anything else that you want to share with the listeners? Nope. All right. Well, thank you guys for sticking with us. It's been a slightly longer episode than normal, but we had plenty to say, and hopefully you will find at least it fractionally useful to you. Um, and if you guys want more of the Scripturian Society, aka more writing encouragement tips, tricks, what we're working on, wanting to hear about what you're working on, you guys can follow us on social media. We are we are on Instagram and TikTok. We are again the Scripturian Society. You can also email our production company at contact at storysirenstudio.com. If you just want to send us like a longer message or you want to suggest a topic for the pod, we would love to hear from you guys. Um, you guys can also reach out to us on social media because we love chatting with you guys, hearing what you're working on. You can also join our writers group on Discord. The link is below. Tell us about your pets. Tell us about your books. Tell us about your bookshelves. Um, tell us that you think we're crazy. Tell me that an armadillo in a castle is okay. Tell me that that is acceptable. Somebody. Support her. Yeah, support me. <laughs> Lie to me, you guys. Come on. 
<laughs> but anyways, also, if you guys enjoyed this or you didn't fully hate it, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a glowing review, that would be wonderful. Make it glow like the light of Carissa's intelligence. And uh, we should. I thought you were gonna say like the light of Christ, just to be on topic. <laughs> that also works. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Don't 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 hide that light under a bushel. You know, really yeah, let the on, light guys. shine. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, go ahead and leave us a review. And you guys are like, shut up, stop asking for that. We're never gonna do it. Um, <laughs> please do. I'm gonna ask every week because it's just part of part of my long spiel. You guys have to listen to that. I know that you tune out of every time. And um, yeah. That's all that's all I got. So until next week, keep writing. And we'll see you on the next page. <laughs>